There are a lot of trade notes in E4, and it's time to rank them in the only objective way possible, a tier list. Now, compared to normal, when it comes to trade notes, they don't exactly have an icon for each one. So what I've gone ahead and done is picked the national flag, which I believe represents each note the best. Now, I really struggled thinking about how to display the information regarding the trade notes. A map to be high enough resolution to be seen will take up like 80% of the screen space. So I'm going to assume that if you're watching a trade note tier list guide for E4, you probably know where things like London and Beijing are. And for the more obscure notes like Cuyaba and Ohio, I will include a short verbal description of where we are about in the world. I'm also going to go with the verbal description because I know a bunch of you guys just listen to these tier lists in, as a mini podcast. So I feel like putting a map and saying, here it is guys, look, is not going to be the most helpful. Anyway, regarding my flag choices, it's usually done to be as understandable as possible. So for things like the Genoese trade note, I went with the Genoa flag. For Venice, I went with Venice. And for the English channel, well, no prices for guessing, GB. This does mean that for some nodes, the flags become an issue, namely what to do in central China. So for that purpose, I've selected the flags as best as I can. With that all said and done, we now enter the how are they ranked debate. And the good news is trade nodes for the most part are there to make you money. And in some very fringe cases can be made slightly nicer with easier access to trading buffs. Now if you have access to an Indian node on lockdown, you'll probably find yourself holding the trading in silk plus a max promoted culture buff. Now when it comes to doing a world conquest global empire ranking, Every trade node is equally amazing, because owning more is just better. You can argue over how technically expanding into node A over node B is technically better or something, but come on, if you're going for a world conquest, it's pretty simple. Steer the world, the world into your most upstream node. Capture something upstream? Great. Now you can push up more or have less of your trade being nicked. Capture something downstream? Great. Now you can steer into your main node. Capture something on the opposite side of the planet? Great. Make bank from the trade sharing being over 10 nodes. So instead of ranking them in the sense of what's the best note for a world conquest, for which the answer is all of them, I'll instead be ranking them in a more non-blobby or a more casual play for single player, where you're not conquering the world, or for MP, where there are players stopping you doing that. Basically, if you only have access to one or, or at most a couple nodes, how good is that node in question? How easy it is to steal money from your neighbours, and how easy it is to be stolen from are going to be the big factors here. Anyway, enough to stay but before we do begin, I will however ask for the usual things. A like would be great if you haven't already, and a subscription would be amazing. But with that all said and done, let's begin with Aleppo. Aleppo is an interesting one in terms of how good it is at building up an empire, because you have Alexandria and Constantinople being able to steer out of you. It's not good that they are able to steer out of you well. They can't steer out of you well because you're a, not an inland node, so they can't just shove a merchant and then get most of the trade power. However, Constantinople and Alexandria both have a decent amount of trade centers inside of them and a decent amount of trade power being generated by them. So they're quite good at steering out of you, regardless of the fact that you're not actually an inland node. You do have Basra and Persia coming into you as well. So with that said, it kind of balances out because you can nick a lot of money going into you. The trade goods inside of you are pretty decent as well in terms of Aleppo. It's a very middle of the pack trade node. My issue with Aleppo as a node is that most of the time, if you are playing in that area, you kind of have to either kill the Ottomans or kill the Mamluks. Most of the time both, to be honest. Because if you don't, they're going to kill you. If you're playing in like a single player environment, and definitely in a multiplayer environment. And most of the time, if you are playing in multiplayer in that area, you're playing as the Mamluks or the Ottomans. So you kind of end up conquering that node while owning the others. It's a bit of a weird one to rank for this reason, because there are very few campaigns where I'm like, okay, Aleppo is my main node. Aleppo is the kind of node where you tend to conquer it instead of build your empire around. In terms of conquering it for value, it's a nice one. It's one of the two that can nick from Persia, and that becomes a, kind of a big deal because Persia is a very good trade node to nick from. So that's important. And Basra is a pretty okay-ish node on that regard as well. Unfortunately, being able to get nick from Alexandria and Constantinople is a pretty big setback, but it's by no means a bad node as well. So with that all said and done, I think for me, it's going to be pretty reasonable to be shoving Constantinople be pretty reasonable for me to be shoving Aleppo into pretty comfortable B tier for me. It's not the best node on the planet, but it's definitely decent. With that said, we move on to Alexandria. Alexandria, or Egypt I've used for this one, is an interesting one. It gets a lot of trade notes coming into it. You've got your Aleppo, as mentioned before. You can also suck from Ethiopia, which is an inland one, so that's a good one to nick trade out of. And Gulf of Aden is, well, coastal, absolutely. But it tends to be quite rich because a lot of Indian stuff kind of ends up in there. So it's a very nice one to nick out of. Um, to, Well, not nick out of Alexandria. We'll get to nick it out of Alexandria in a second. But basically, it's quite good to steer things into Alexandria. It's a very nice note in that regard. The issue with it is upstream, you've got Constantinople, Jura, and Venice. All three of those nodes are really high developed nodes. Those are all three of those nodes have a lot of, well, centers of trade, and they're pretty well built up, so they're going to have high level centers of trade. 
So those three nodes are going to be sucking a lot of trade out of you. And when people are building around in Concert Open, which are in Venice, they tend to, well, want to nick out of you. So it's going to be a very highly contested node. With that said, the potential from Alexandria is already quite good. And it's quite easy as Alexandria to just expand one more node into your Constantinople, your Genoas, and your Venices. And kind of consolidate your trade around that way. In, the other thing with Alexandria that's quite helpful is thankfully you're not an inland node. Because if you're an inland node, you know, your trade would be just gone. Because all of the OPMs would just shove a merchant there, you, you know, you'll be over. But it's at least uh, coastal, so you can at least defend yourself reasonably well. You're not getting all that merchant trade power from that inland power. So I think Alexandria holds up quite well for me. The trade goods in it are quite nice. You get the Granite and Mediterranean buffs as well. I honestly think Alexandria is a pretty good node overall. And so for that reason, we're going to be having our first entry into A tier. With that said, we now move on to our next one, which is the Amazon. It's a starting node. It's, as you may have guessed, in the Amazon. And you could probably guess by the Native American uh, selected for it. There's not a lot going on in there. You steer to Brazil and the Caribbean. Caribbean tends to be quite populated. It tends to get colonized and have a lot of trade power in there. The Amazon is a terrible trade node. It's not even a good one to nick out of when you have a colonial empire. It's, it's just awful. Do not, do not do anything in the Amazons. The general rule of thumb is, however, is that if you are a starting node, you're going to be in D tier, and the Amazon are no exception to that. With that said, we move on to Astrakhan. It's an interesting one. Astrakhan is, much like Aleppo mentioned previously, one of the two nodes that's able to pull out of Persia. And Persia is a very good node to pull out of because it's an urn one and tends to be quite rich. So for that, it's quite nice. Astrakhan also can pull out of Samarkand, which has a couple of things similar to Persia going for it. It tends to be quite a wealthy node. However, it is an inland node. So Crimea and Kazan, which tend to be at least similar in terms of its size, can reasonably push out of it. The thing is, if you're playing in that area, you tend to be kind of playing a horde or someone that's killing a lot of hordes. So basically a Russia campaign or something similar to that regard. So consolidating those areas around you isn't too much of an issue for the most part. So Astrakhan is in a very weird position where if you play it well, I think it can be good. But if you just sit around on Astrakhan and you aren't actively pulling out of Persia and Samarkand, it can be quite weak. There's not too much going on in Astrakhan itself. The potential there is basically in a theft. It's not great on its own. But the potential there is quite good in terms of how you can build up. And you can definitely build a great trade empire from Astrakhan as your base. You can push upstream into Novgorod in that area. You can push downstream into Persia. Absolutely. So I think Astrakhan definitely gets carried a lot by its potential. Unfortunately, raw power-wise, I can't put it any further above a B. That said, we move on to Australia. Well, it's not a starting node, but it may as well be. Australia is also in a weird position where it may as well also be an end node. It's in the opposite end of the world, and it only goes to the Malaccas. Thing is with Australia is that it's so pathetic that you can't really steal trade out of it, right? It's a bit like trying to tax the Irish. Quite simple to do, but you're not exactly getting a lot of tax revenue from, right? It's a, it's a bit of a weird situation, which means that when you look at it in isolation, you'll be thinking, oh, it's actually not that bad to end with, right? The Polynesian Triangle, you can mix some stuff out of it. You can build up Australia. It's really painful to dev. There's not that many provinces, but, you know, you can do it great. So you build up Australia. The problem is, by the time you're actually in a position to build up Australia, playing as a native Australian tribe, or if you colonized it, well... Whatever's going on in the Moluccas has also had time to build up. And assuming equal skill, or at least the AI that's not completely brain dead, the Moluccas have built up a lot more than you have. So by the time you have things worth stealing from your node, the Moluccas are going to be developed enough to steal from you, is the long and short of it. So at the start of the game, you're so poor that no one's stealing from you. And by the time you're rich enough to actually have something worth stealing, they're in a position to steal from you. So overall, it's just terrible. You can suck from the Polynesian Triangle, but there are better nodes that do that. And the trade goods, I mean, I think you have a coal province. Uh, but that's about it, really. It's, it's Australia gameplay. You're not going to be happy. Um, technically, I would argue better than a, than a starting node of uh, Amazon. But you're comparing poverty to poverty here. There's not much to talk about. They're both terrible. It's not much short of it. And with that, we move on to the Baltic Sea. That's an interesting one. So the Baltic Sea is an inland sea, so it's actually a sea. You don't have to worry about merchants nicking from you. Unfortunately, you really do have to worry about merchants nicking from you. You have Krakow, which you can steer into the Baltic Sea, and that's a good one to, well, steal, because Poland tends to produce a lot of goods produced, especially in the Second Age with their age bonus. The problem with the Polish goods production is they can't really defend their trade because Krakow is an inland node, and there's loads of Germans and loads of 
well, people in the Baltic Sea that have spare merchants that can shove it in Krakow and just suck loads of money out of Poland. So it's a good one to steal from that. The issue is, is that yes, you're good at stealing money from Krakow. And if you go into Novgorod, you can also start stealing money from Russia and that kind of build as well. The main problem is, of course, you go to Lubeck. And when it comes to sucking a lot of trade, Lubeck is amazing for that. Even though, again, you're an inland sea, Lubeck is going to be stealing a lot of money from you. And that's kind of the, a lot of the thing that's holding you back. The problem is you're also very reliant on stealing trade. The Baltic Sea itself isn't actually great in terms of just how much money you make compared to just going down south into the German area. You do have Dallas Skogen, so you can really build up. And Sweden, and especially that area, is definitely more of a scalar. Like, it could, it, there's a lot of potential in that land, but it doesn't start great. It starts pretty underdeveloped. And the problem is, is that because you don't have access to your trade income, you end up being poorer than your neighbors, which means that they get to develop faster, they get to dev click more because they can afford more, you know, they can afford better advisors, so they get to suck more trade out of you. The Baltic Sea is this in this really weird situation where in the ideal world it can actually be a very good trade node. And if you are in single player building a tall Sweden play and you can just suck out of Krakow, you can consolidate the Baltic Sea node, you can prevent Lubeck stealing all your money, it's a very nice node. But if you can't do that, you you end up be getting really screwed over. Yes, you can steal some money from Krakow. Yes, you can steal some money from Novgorod. But Novgorod can prevent that. And Krakow, well, there's enough people trying to steal from that note, is what I will say. So you end up in this weird situation of almost high risk, high reward. And the problem is, I think with equal skill levels, the people playing Novgorod and the people playing Lubeck-based, you know, Germany kind of tags are going to be better than you and are going to prevent you doing that. So... It's, it's a bit of a weird one, but I have to respect its relatively high potential. So for that reason, I think it does easily make its way into B tier, but I'm not going to put it any higher than that. After that, we move on to Basra. Basra is an interesting one. Again, it's coastal. It does um, go to Persia. So hey, that's that's something you can move upstream into Persia. It's always a good thing to have. And it doesn't account for Mus. It's a very interesting trade node in the sense that, and this is why I went for the Arabia thing, because it kind of is the central Arabia area for the most part. So it's not very rich, but you're kind of very close to a lot of wealthy areas. So Basra is in a weird situation where if you look at Basra in isolation and you go, is this trade node good? The answer is no. The problem is everywhere around it is so the, so the Basra trade node is a great situation to start in because you can expand into wealthier trade nodes around you, right? The areas around you, um, your Yemen, um, Hormuz, basically, going to Alexandria, going to Constantinople, going to Persia, all of these areas are really good areas to go for trade specifically. It's just you kind of sit in a, literally this Middle Eastern desert that, you know, all hasn't been invented yet. You are completely useless, right? So you can kind of like skirt a little bit around you you can like you know take little scrap pickings from Hormuz which is a bit hard to do because again Hormuz tends to be quite heavy trade efficiency um trade power wise and Hormuz is a coastal one so it's a bit hard to even steal from that but you yourself aren't great so I think we have to bear in mind that Basra's power really comes from the fact that you can leave Basra not because Basra itself is any good so for that I'm going to be really knocking it down arguably quite harshly but if you are playing in Basra don't you know despair just go outside of you. Basically, any direction to go from Basra is good. You go south, great, you're hitting the Ethiopia, you're hitting the Gulf of... Um, uh, you're hitting the Yemen land, great, great places to go into, you know. And go west, go east, go north, everywhere's great, right, as Basra. Just don't stay in Basra, you're not going to build a trade empire on Basra alone. So, because it's... it can be also used as a decent stepping stone if you are building a trade empire around that, I think it's good enough to knock into C tier. It's definitely not a D tier, but I'm going to have to struggle just to find anything above that. It's just not a nice node to have, even within these Omega trade builds that you can end up having go for you. Next, we move on to Beijing. Beijing is an interesting one. Um, so, with things with Beijing, like it has a decent chunk of things from China coming into it, but Beijing is also a great one to problem with Beijing is it concentrates the Chinese wealth in it so you can also concentrate your theft from China on Beijing 
in a weird way, if that if that makes any sense. So it's kind of a weird concentration. You end up actually having your trade kind of spread out as China sometimes, if someone's trying to nick it from you, if you are playing in that area. It tends to be, though, that if you are playing in the China area, you're probably not starting as me, so you, you know, you've conquered it as a horde. So it's not that big of an issue. Overall, that, like, over-concentration of Chinese wealth, I think don't think is a problem, because you're not exactly an inland node. But let's be completely honest here. It's very much carried by the fact that it is in China. The node itself, if you remove that, like in terms of this pure well, value produced, I mean, it's good, but it's it's a weirdly enough, I think one of the weaker Chinese ones. Uh, I mean, Xi'an, I think, is the worst, but like Zhangzhou, just on its own, is a lot better, uh, just in terms of the goods produced and the things out there. You, Beijing is very much carried by Beijing as a as a node itself, and you can really see that as a horde when you're conquering into China, is that you. You grab your Beijing area, and you're like, I'm now a bit more afloat than you were before, but then when you start pushing deeper into China, that's so you can start really seeing the spoils of war coming in. That said, though, it's a good way to concentrate to the Chinese trade. I've seen quite negative at the moment, but let's be honest, it's a good node. It can concentrate your Chinese wealth for you. No real complaints over there. And the thing is with Beijing, Beijing itself is a very nice province. It's, it's just a good place to have. You just have to be careful with Beijing, is that you have to bear in mind there's only two centers of trade in Beijing. So if someone's trying to contest, if you concentrate your money in Beijing, you can just get privateered down to you know, oblivion, or you can get all your, sta your trade steered away. So just something to be mindful of that. However, you are able to concentrate Chinese wealth, and it's just a very nice node on its own. So despite all of these initial like negative things I've said about it, I think there's not going to be too much complaints about putting Beijing into A tier. So now we move on to Bengal. Bengal is a wonderful one. The situation, the trade situation in Bengal is. Interesting to say the least, um, a lot of trade notes, uh, you have a huge amount of centers of trade. Uh, at last count, I believe something like nine. I might be just wrong. Uh, might be ten, actually. But don't quote me on that. I mean, open E4 and check. I believe you have nine or ten trade notes, so it's centers of trade. So it's very, very powerful. And the thing is with Bengal, a lot of the good Indian trade goods are in Bengal. So on its own, it's rich. You are incredibly wealthy go for you and you have access to nick and trade from malacca which is incredibly good you can steer from burma which is definitely not bad and you can even nibble a bit at lahasa the nice thing with living away is lahasa is there's not a lot of um well money or trade power there but it's in that node so it's very easy to nick out of as well just shove a mer merchant in there and there you go you've got like 40 percent of it you know on lockdown i'll grade all your centers and you don't even need to expand in lahasa you probably have like 70 percent of the merchant just from the downstream trade power you do have to be careful, however. You do want to either expand it to Coromandel, because Coromandel can nick money from you, or have some kind of arrangement where that doesn't happen. But it's something to be very much aware of. And Doab is another thing to bear in mind, because they can nick trade from you. Doab is an inland node, so just grabbing a couple provinces in Doab and getting some centers of trade there to contest it with a merchant to protect yourself in Doab will be nice, because it's an inland node to get the merchant trade steer, the merchant inland buff, so you know. It, Doab isn't that much of a threat, but Coromandel certainly is, because the thing is with Coromandel, is Coromandel already starts quite consolidated between Vijay and Bahmanis, um, so whichever one of the two wins there, hopefully you want none of them to win if you're playing around the Bengal area, and you kind of want to go in there yourself. Otherwise though, Bengal is a wonderful node, it's a wonderful node to expand into, it's a wonderful node to build your trade empire around. It's not perfect, but it's definitely up there as one of the better nodes in the game, so I think it's going to be, again, not much contention if I'm putting Bengal straight into A tier. With that, we move on to Bordeaux. It's a weird node. So France has a lot of things going for you. Trade is not one of them initially. Now, France has a great trade situation if they go outside of France. If they push into the English Channel, they have the English Channel, which is amazing. If they push into Genoa, they have the Gen you know, Genoa for them, which is amazing. If they push into Sevilla, they have Sevilla, which is, again, pretty amazing. The actual French nodes themselves suffer from being surrounded by a lot stronger nodes. So that's going to be applied to both Bordeaux and Champagne, but we're talking about Bordeaux now. Bordeaux does only go to Champagne, so you can kind of defend yourself there, but most of the time with Bordeaux, you don't really want to because you want to be staring to Champagne because your capital is probably in Champagne and you're collecting there as France before you move your trade capital to somewhere like the English Channel. With that said, you get a decent chunk of, a decent chunk of stuff coming into it. If you are playing as France, Bordeaux is how your colonial wealth, if you go for it, is going to enter your country. That's your Ivory Coast, that's the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and that's the Caribbean. They all go to Bordeaux, which you know you can't complain about. 
And it's not exactly an inland node like Champagne, so it's at least somewhat defendable. It's a, it's a very workhorse kind of um, trade node for me. You're very rarely building an empire around it unless you're playing Brittany, which, I mean, go for the Brittany enjoyers out there, but most time as France, you tend to be moving into the other nodes anyway, even within a multiplayer context. So it's a bit of a hard one to talk about because it's just kind of used as a stepping stone node into the bed, into Champagne, which then goes to either Genoa or the Cham. But for what you do have, you do have a relatively decently sized node. You have, I think, three centers of trade you can upgrade, as well as two estuaries, so you're not exactly doing bad in terms of domestic trade power. It's a very workhorse, um, you know, trade node, and it's certainly not bad with the development and trade goods present at the start, even if it's a bit wine heavy. So for me, it's probably bottom of B tier or near that, but I think B tier is probably fair for Bordeaux. With that, though, we move on to Brazil. It may as well be a starting node. I'm sorry, Amazonas is like, what, one ducat? Maybe five if you really build it up, like, what, ten by the late game? Rio de la Plata, what, about the same? Well, actually, Rio de la Plata's got a decent chunk of land in it, so if you are really building up your colonies and have, like, almost a player in them, sure, I guess they're nice, but it's just quite weak. You do go to Ivory Coast, so you have at least one thing going for you, is that if you move up to Ivory Coast, you can at least control Brazil somewhat. And, you, and if you are playing purely in the New World, Brazil kind of consolidates the local trade nodes from around the area into it. So it kind of can work for a, specifically if you're playing in South America, kind of trade node, where you kind of trade, try and send everything into Brazil. Well, that said, it's not even great at that job. The problem is, is that if you're playing in South America, you kind of almost want to go into the Ivory Coast, because otherwise it's very easy for someone like the Portuguese or the Spanish to just shop outside the coast with 100 light ships and take all of your hard-earned money. So, you know, something to be very much aware of. And it's going to be very hard-earned money, because I'll tell you what's not present in Brazil, a lot of developer the game start. That's every single dev point is going to be an expensive dev click in the jungle, so bear that in mind. Rio del Plata is a bit better to dev push, but we're not talking about Rio del Plata, we're talking about Brazil. And at the start of the game, you're still going to need to colonize it, you're still going to need to build it up, and you're still going to need to make it good. Even, you can't just nick from it just because it already exists there at the start. It's a very weird one for me for Brazil to debate it where to put it if that makes any sense because if we're talking about the pure game star situation it's definitely a detail but the potential can argue for something like the low c the problem is it's a lot of potential you're putting into it so i i can't i don't think i could justify a c tier for it i think top of d tier is probably going to be fair for it but i can't i can't see going all the way up to c but that's just me we then move on to burma burma's a fun one you nick from Chengdu, which is not a great trade node. You're basically a glorified starting node again. But hey, uh, at least you don't go anywhere major. Oh wait, you go to Bengal and Siam. Very hard to defend your trade node. You're an inland node. You only have a couple centers of trade, so it's very hard to build up for it. And you have a couple estuaries. Furthermore, Siam and Bengal tend to be either very center of trade heavy or completely overboard with development. And there's a lot of development in Bengal and Siam, so your trade is going to be nicked. That's just something you're going to have to accept. It's just not nice simply because of how much land, how much trade for you can be nicked. What you have going for you at the start, if you're if you're at least holding on to it, isn't actually bad. The trade goods are decent and the development is okay. It's kind of lower by Asian standards. Asia has an obscene amount of development and great trade goods. So you're kind of like lagging behind your Asian like co-patriots, forever you want to call it. But if you compare it to other trade nodes in Africa or other places, you're very much ahead there, so no worries about that. On average, you're still above average. With that said, not a lot of great potential. Burma's a great intermediary node. Burma's a great one to conquer when you're playing around Bengal and Siam, or you're, you know, a great one to push into. But building a trade empire around Burma is just a pain. And realistically, if you are playing in the Burma area, you're probably going to be grabbing another trade node in the, air, in the process. So for me, Burma, I mean, the base development is going to maintain you at C tier, and you're at least raw potential is decent. Uh, not raw potential. <clears throat> your raw power is decent, but your lack of potential, I think, is really what's holding you back here at Burma. With that said, we move on to everyone's favorite, California. That's a weird one. So California nicks from the Hudson Bay, which is awful. You have one center of trade, and every single thing on the planet is stealing from California. Girin in... Um, so Girin, that's basically your Alaska trade node. Um, not Alaska, to be clear, sorry, that's your Siberia, actual, like, Siberia coastline, if that makes sense. 
trade note is nicking from that. Mexico is nicking from you. Mississippi is ripping from Even the Hawaiian Polynesia is nicking from you. Yet you are a glorified trade note and you just can't defend yourself. You don't have a lot going for you. You have a lot of land. You have a lot of really bad land is the other issue. You genuinely have a whole bunch of Arctic promises, a whole bunch of mountains, and not a lot of gold, especially by New World standards. Just a pretty bad trade note all around. I'm sorry, California, but... Your place in D tier is well deserved in my opinion. It's at least okay because at least you can steer one node into it, but you're not building a trade empire around California is all I'm telling you. With that said, we move on to Canton. This is the first one where I'm a bit like, uh, what do I use for the flag? So I looked at one of the releasables from the China area and went with them. Not, you know, not better, not worse than anything else. Canton is interesting. So now it does... Um... So with Canton... You can now snick from Siam, which is nice, I guess, if it's any consolation. Um, Siam's a nice one to nick out of. The problem is a lot of things can also nick out of Siam. With Siam, you, with Canton, you also get to nick out of uh, Chengdu. So you'll be thinking, oh, there's not a lot of... There's not too much trade power you can nick out of. Siam's pretty contested. Chengdu is not a great node to nick out of. And you're going all the way to Malacca, which is a very rich node. You go to the Philippines, which can be quite a decent potential. And you go into Shanzhou, which again is quite a decent node. The thing is with Canton is that it makes up for all of this by just being filthy rich on its own. It's definitely one of the workhorse Chinese um, trade nodes. Very highly developed, especially the game start. A lot of really good trade goods. It's just a very workhorse, you know, trade node. This is the trade node that you conquer to get the money from China. It's Canton. It's Zhanzhou. Th those are the trade nodes that make China rich for the most part, if that makes any sense. That's what a lot of your development is. And with four trade nodes, it was four centers of trade and two estuaries. You're pretty defensible as well if you want to defend Canton. I would recommend as China or any kind of play in that area to either conquer Canton as something like Siam to secure upstream. Or if you're playing as China to conquer upstream from Canton and just pull from it, right? It's not a great one to end tag yourself. But it's a great workhorse trade, uh, trade node. And this is the trade node that you want to steer and make money from. So for that reason, I think Canton is going to be Without a without a doubt, early in space in the B2 for me. It's a bit of a better workforce than the French one. Honestly, probably knock it up to pretty high in B2. But again, the placements inside the tiers, I like to think they... I like to fiddle with them, but they're not that important. It's mainly which tier you're in. Anyway, enough mini disclaimers in the middle of the video. We now move on to the Cape of Good Hope. This was a fun one to find a flag for. There are literally no tags on the Cape of Good Hope. Like, at all. Great. Really helpful. So I with the Zulu, they kind of spawn near there, and cool flag is cool flag. With the Cape of Good Hope, you only go to Ivory Coast, so it's beautiful to you basically use as your end node. And the thing with the Cape of Good Hope is that if you are also playing around Zanzibar, which is a very nice trade node, we'll get Zanzibar later, colonizing the Cape of Good Hope makes Zanzibar an end node, and you kind of want to do that, because if Cape of Good Hope isn't colonized, then Zanzibar is basically an end node. And it's a great one simply because it's able to really utilize the potential of Zanzibar. It also does mean that if you're someone like England and a colonizer, you're able to colonize the Cape and immediately start making money from India and Malacca. So it's a great one for just stealing money from Asia. It's an excellent one for theft. The trade goods inside of it aren't amazing, but they're decent. It's still Africa and you got some ivory in there. There's even a coal province, which, you know, I can't knock down a peg. And I don't think that much gold there, but, you know, you can get some gold. So decent trade goods, weirdly enough for a trade node that you need to colonize, decent development as well, and I think that has to be mentioned. So it's a great one to expand into. Your prop thing is with ranking the Cape of Good Hope as starting a campaign around it, you, you're literally not doing that because no, no one is in the Cape of Good Hope at game start. So it's more of a, is it worth expanding into node? And the honest answer is absolutely. The Cape is a very good node with a lot of its potential from being able to nick from a lot of areas. And while I don't think it's as high up as the other A tiers, I think it does just barely squeeze into the A tier above. It's certainly a cut above the B tiers, to be clear. With that, we move on to the Caribbean. Woo. Now, the Caribbean are probably the definition of your workhorse. It's the, kind of, it's the best way of summarizing Caribbean is it's, it's very much the Bengal of the New World. You can definitely concentrate a lot of the New World trade from the Amazon, um, and it, even the Africa value from the, uh, the even the African trade from the Ivory Coast, you can get your Mexico money, you can get your Mississippi, you can steer Panama, you can steer all of this new world wealth into the Caribbean. The problem is you're also going to Sevilla, Chesapeake Bay, and Bordeaux. So if you're a Bordeaux or Sevilla or Chesapeake Bay based 
tag, so you're, you're playing as the US, Spain, or China, that's great. Or even as England, and you have control of the USA, right? The thing is, with that, is that's only good if you're expanding into the Caribbean from downstream. If you're playing as a Native American and you're playing as the USA, all that means is using the Caribbean as your end node. That just lets people like Bordeaux, Sevilla, uh, that just lets your France and your Castilians to, on Spanish, just send like a fleet of 100 light ships and steal half your money, right? So it's very much a double-edged sword, but it's an incredible workhorse trade node. And much like Bengal, it also has a lot of good trip provinces, a lot of very highly dev provinces, especially for game start and colonial areas. The Caribbean is incredibly well dev for what it is at the game start. So it's the relative lack of province count compared to someone like Central America is very deceptive because the provinces there are like 10 development at game start already. And if you call out some of the plus three dev from the um, from the age ability or from the England um, missions and things like that, it's even better, right? So there's a lot of good development there. Caribbean definitely is a very, very good trade node and it's a very much a workhorse Bengal style trade node. So for that reason, it's going to be sitting right next to Bengal in A tier. After that, we do move on to the Coromandel. Now, we talked a little bit about Coromandel, we talked about Bengal, and that's certainly an area you can nick from. You can also nick from Dakar, which, again, is a great node to uh, steal from. Let's be absolutely clear here. But, again, the thing is the Coromandel is you kind of have the same problem as Bengal. A lot of things can nick from you. Gujarat tends to have a lot of, like, I would say, like, India trade-focused um, uh, tags over there, so they're going to steal a bunch from you. The Gulf of Aden has a bunch of trade-focused tags in there, and the Cape of Good Hope, Cape of Good Hope, tends to be colonized by people that focus on trade. There's going to be a lot of competition for, to maintain your stranglehold on Coromandel. However, the potential from maintaining Coromandel and trying to expand downstream is amazing. The Khan is an excellent trade node. Bengal is an excellent trade node, and the thing is with holding on to Coromandel is much like Bengal. Dear Lord alive, you have an obscene amount of centers of trade. I think when I last counted for when I was writing this script for this video. It was something really stupid, um, like 13, I think, centers of trade with two estuaries. So all of these amazing centers of trade you're able to just use to generate obscene amounts of trade power in yourself to defend yourself from other people's steering. And bear in mind, you're not an inland node. You're a coastal node. You're a proper one like that. So it's very hard to nick from you with an inland merchant. It's going to be contested. Now, that does mean that, of course, someone can send a bunch of trade ships towards you. But there's counter to that. Worst comes to worst, carrying more of them and sinking all their heavy ships, uh, sinking all their trade ships with your heavy ships, right? And the thing is with the Coromandel, on its own, even if you can all those other potential, it's also really, really rich. There's a lot of really good development in Coromandel. Again, Coromandel is one of the nodes that makes India incredibly wealthy. So for that reason, I think Coromandel, again, is definitely going to be entering the 80s. It's a very excellent trade node. With that, though, we move on to our next contender, and that is going to be Champagne. I've got Burgundy selected for them. It could have been France as well, but I kind of used France for the previous um, Bordeaux trade node, so that's what I mean by Champagne here specifically. Champagne's a weird node. It's surprisingly wealthy for what it is, because there's a lot of good development in Champagne. The problem is, you're an inland node surrounded by trade monoliths, because you have Genoa that can steer uh, out of you, and you have um, the English Channel Caster out of you. Both those places have a obscene amount of trade power. So good luck defending it. Those six centers of trade that you have inside of you aren't going to do much to defend it. Bordeaux and Rhineland do go into you, so you can nick some from Bordeaux, and that's kind of what you end up happening if you're playing kind of France. And even as Germany, you kind of want to almost expand into Champagne to secure Rhineland, like, leaking away into it. But the thing is, Rhineland is it's going to leak because Rhineland leaks to everything on the planet. So bear that in mind. Rhineland, of course, also been an inland node, so it's very, very easy to steer out of. It just kind of means that, realistically, you just have an English channel player who, if they have too much, too many merchants, which is a surprisingly common problem. That was the last song, sound. Sorry about that. But yeah, anyway, um, if Champagne just... If the English player or the Genoa player or whoever's playing in those trade notes has a bunch of merchants, they're going to shove a merchant in Champagne and Rhineland, and then goodbye to all of your money. Congratulations. It's, for that reason, very much held back. Weirdly enough, again, though, it has a lot of good development. So just even if you have, like, 50% of the node, it's still actually okay. So <laughs> it's it's a weird one for me for that reason. It's a bit worse than Bordeaux. I honestly think, just because of how easy it is to nick out of it, it's more of a C tier for me. But it's definitely up there as one of the better C tiers out that you can get. Because, again, if you conquer upstream from it, you can kind of lock it down. And when you do lock it down... 
it's a very nice trade note. The development there starting there is great. The terrain to dev is great. And the trade goods are certainly not bad as well. So with that said, we move on to our next entry. And that is going to be Shengdu. Great. Another, uh, chi another Chinese trade node. This one, however, is not one of the workhorses for the um, for China. I went for another releasable within Ming. You can nick from Lahasa. That's not saying much. Um, Lahasa's not a great trade node. But hey, you can nick from it. And you do go to Canton, Zia, and Burma. Great. It's fun, kind of sad. The trade nodes are okay, but the problem is compared to the rest of China, which is very nice to dev and got loads of farmland and grassland, Chengdu tends to be a bit more rainforesty which makes it a bit more painful to build up as well. And it's just not built up well at the start either. It's a very awkward trade node. The religions there are a mess for anyone going into it because it's kind of a... Well, it's just not good for anyone going into it. It's just a very awkward trade node. And if you really focus on it and really build it up, it becomes okay. But you have to really work on that trade node only to then nick out of it later. And I mean, you suddenly do that in a major empire. You suddenly will do that as China. But it requires quite a bit of an investment before you, you know, start getting your big money out of it for me it's a bit of a weird one it's not inherently awful but it's not good as well so into c tier it goes with that said though we move on to the chesapeake bay or chesapeake 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 i think it's chesapeake anyway chesapeake bay this is basically the usa player trade uh, trade node you get to nick out of caribbean and ohio thing is with nicking out of caribbean it just kind of means that it's upstream from the thing that concentrates all the trade power in the new world so that just makes it better because it can steer from caribbean the caribbean is a good node to steer out of the problem with the chesapeake bay is you go to english channel and you go to the gulf of st lawrence if there's an england player and they have canada and you don't well you should probably invade canada is all i will say because gulf of st lawrence and english channel will both generate a lot of trade power and make a lot of it while you very much suffer from the same problem as the Caribbean because you almost contribute to the Caribbean problem as being one of the people that can nick out of it. But you also have that issue with upstream people nicking your trade. And the English Channel is probably the worst thing to have upstream from you because that thing prints trade power, right? The Whatever's happening in England is, is farmlands. It's just going to be pressing the dev button in whatever situation. If it's England invaded by Scotland, if it's space England, if it's England invaded by France, whatever's happening in England, it's pressing the dev button and it's going to be quite built up even AI is going to press that dev button and it's going to be built upgrading all those centers of trade. And most importantly, it's going to build my ships. You're going to have a hard time being, you know, upstream from the English Channel is the best way of putting it. And that's really what's holding Chesapeake Bay down. With that said, it's a great one to go into as someone like England because, again, downstream from the English Channel, so you're going to have a decent grasp hold of it. And if you are playing around as the USA, basically the Gulf of St. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, if you also do control the Gulf of St. Lawrence, you could at least try and somewhat end node by killing any English light ships and trying to protect yourself with centers of trade. The problem is you only have the one center of trade to actually protect yourself and a couple of estuaries, so it's quite painful to do. But it's certainly an uphill battle, but the rewards are nice. You can get you can at least try and monopolize the trade of the new world, and that's a pretty decent thing to aim towards. So it takes a lot of work, but decent potential. I think that's definitely just a B sounding tier for me without rush. Oh, I've selected the things. Nice. Can I select them? Nice. Okay. We now move on to Constantinople. Now, you're wondering why am I using the Byzantine uh, flag instead of the Ottoman one? Because the Ottomans do have a lot more trade power there at the game start. Well, the answer is it's called Constantinople, not Istanbul. So, you know, Byzantium it is. Um, thing is, Constantinople is it's amazing. <laughs> There's not much way of going around it. You have four centers of trade, but you have a huge amount of development inside of your area. And you get to nick from a lot of pretty nice trade goods, uh, from pretty nice trade notes. Crimea is quite nice because you can kind of pilfer some of the Persia money kind of coming through that area. Alexandria is just a really good one to nick out of as well. There's a lot of good development out of there. It's just a very nice uh, trade note to steer out of. And Aleppo as well. Aleppo is just a decent trade note as discussed before and you can very much nick out of it. The other thing that has to be mentioned with Constantinople and that makes it just that cut above the rest is the fact that Ragusa is the only thing that Constantinople steers to. And if you've conquered Constantinople, say you're doing a Byzantium restoration, or you're just playing as the Ottomans, or whatever situation you end up in, even if you're playing Mamluk and you conquer Constantinople, it's, well, Mamluk's probably the exception there, but it's not that painful for you to move into Ragusa. Even if you're playing somewhere like Hungary and you've conquered down and you've killed the Ottomans, you're probably in a position where you moved into the Ragusa trade already. 
This allows you to basically pursue the end node, the Constantinople trade node, because you have access to it to Ragusa. So no one's going to be steering trade from Constantinople up to Ragusa since you have 100% of it. Or at least unless they're willing to spend two merchants on it. And even then you'll be able to retain a decent chunk of it. What that means is that yeah, when you're playing around Constantinople-based trade, you can kind of pseudo end node yourself relatively easily, and that's quite valuable because you can just prevent other people nicking from you, and you can nick a lot. On top of that, you have really good development and really good trade goods on your land. Your land is quite good for development as well. Um, you've got a bunch of grasslands, some farmlands as well. It's just pretty good land, to be honest, all around. Can't complain. I think Constantinople is definitely one of the nicer tiers in the game. So for that reason, yet again, A tier we go. A lot of A tiers today, but don't worry, we'll get to the native one soon enough. Without moving on to Crimea. Crimea, next from Astrakhan. If Astrakhan's getting money from Persia, it's okay. If it's not, and it can be kind of out of your control, then you're kind of screwed. The problem is with Crimea is you may be an inland sea, but dear lord alive does everything next from you. Constantinople next from you, Kiev next from you, Pest next from you. Crimea is a weird one where if you're playing in Crimea, you tend to be either playing a horde, so you're kind of going to Astrakhan yourself, so it's kind of your upper stream one. In which case, you're probably setting up your trade capital around Astrakhan anyway, using Crimea as your pseudo end node generator, if that makes any sense. Or if you're playing as someone like Lithuania, you're probably going to be steering that money out of Crimea, in which case you're trying to compete with other people like Constantinople and Hungary who are trying to nick that money away from you out of Crimea. So it's a very contested trade node. It tends to be contested quite a bit. The issue with it is that you do actually have a decent chunk of centers of trade. You have around four of them, but the development in them isn't great. So you have to kind of really build up that area to be compatible. It's decent land to dev, especially if you have the Cossacks estate, so let's not be... Um, Let's turn, not turn up no to that, but it's not that big of a node. It's not making too much money. The trade goods are at best okay, is the best way of summarizing Crimea, to be honest. So, I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's, I won't call it a workhorse, but it's trying. I think just because of how easy it is to steal from that, it's going to have to be a high C tier, probably below the um, Champagne node, but it's, it's going to struggle breaking into the Bs, to be honest with me. With that said, we move on to Cueva. I think I pronounced it correctly earlier, but now I've forgotten the pronunciation. It's a South America one. It's a start node. Goes to Lima and Rio de Janeiro. Makes sweet. Nothing of trade. Um, has some potential if you build up for it. At least has a decent chunk of provinces. But it's a very sad. It's a very sad to be day to be there. I'll be honest. Um, yeah, I don't need much explaining there. It's a Native American trade node, and it's a weak Native American trade node. Into D tier it goes. Um, I guess it's pretty comparable to California, to be honest, in terms of its power level. Like, you have less trade nodes going into you, as in nothing, but you have even less thinking out of you. You kind of have the Australia treatment where you're too poor to rob, almost, if that makes sense. But there we go. With that, though, we move on to someone that's definitely not too poor to rob. Dekan. <sighs> this trade node would be so much nicer if you're not in that. This trade node is so much nicer for other people around it. Because it's inland. You nick from Doab, which is nice, but you get stolen by Gujarat, you get stolen by Coromandel. Both of those areas tend to be very heavily based on city trade, and you're inland, so it's very hard to defend yourself without going into those areas. Your money's going to be nicked, is the best way of putting it. The thing is, you have a lot of money to steal as well, so the even if you only have like 50% of the trade node, you're still going to be good enough, is the best way of putting it, but you're just better off expanding outside of it. It's also... A great trade node to conquer and gain because the trade goods there are amazing this is one of your india workhorse um, trade nodes thing is with india is unlike china where there are certainly some trade nodes that are quite bad pretty much all your india trade nodes with the exception of um tibet i don't know if you want to call it india trade nodes. it's kind of a weird one in that like side area because it has a bit of nepal but it's also just awkward anyway the thing is with the India trade nodes is pretty much all of them are actually quite good on the base value of trade goods they generate. Compared to China, we have some real slackers like Xi'an. So with the car and me saying that they're an excellent trade node is a bit already implied. With that said, they're still an excellent trade node. They're inland, so they're easy to steal from though. So just bear in mind, you're going to be fighting Coromandel and Gujarat for trade power. So you're not going to win that in the centers of trade. You're going to have to win that on the battlefield is what I'm going to say. So the fact you are kind of forced into inting if you have that trade node means that it's a great trade node, but I'm not going to put you any above a B tier. It's a pretty decent one at B tier as well. I'll probably have it nearer to the China ones. Certainly, uh, I'd probably rather have that than, well, uh, the Baltic, but there we go. Anyway, that's the Khan talked about. We now moved on to Doab. 
Same problem as the Khan. Uh, in fact, the Khan nicks from you. You're also the inland one, you're also in China. You have five centers as well, so you can kind of try and defend yourself, but you're not going to win. Thankfully, you um, you can nick from Bengal. The problem is, that is not a war you're going to win with Bengal. Bengal needs to conquer like a tiny bit of you and shove a merchant in you, and you're not going to win that. But hey, at least you um, at least you have something that's going for you um, in terms of your other potential. It's um, it's a weird one in the sense that you do go to Dekan and Lahore. Dekan isn't actually that good at nicking from you because, well, each itself is getting nicked from. But if someone's conquered Dekan when they have Coromandel or, ben or Coromandel set up, then they're going to be quite a good at nicking from you. And then there's Lahore. Lahore's a weird one. A game start is not going to be nicking much from you. You're going to be relatively fine. The thing is, Lahore is where a lot of the Persia like trade node is really going to be shining. So if you let Lahore build up, or if Lahore gets built up, it's going to steal from you. It's going to steal the fortune. So there's a lot of downwards potential there. It's a decent workhorse trade, trade node, though. Very similar to Dakar in its kind of setup there. A bit of a different problem and a bit of a different front you're addressing. You're not exactly moving down in Coromandel. You have to move north into Lahore to defend yourself from your trade the nicking issues. But the thing is, with the Doab, again, you have a lot of trade to defend. So for that reason... Um, well, you can be going to beat here as well. Uh, pretty much, pretty near to them. They're pretty interchangeable, to be honest, but it is what it is. With that said, we move on to the English Channel. This is the trade node that defines the S-tier, is the best way of putting it. It's the best end node out of all of them. It's the thing that's the easiest to steer everything into. Well, loads of trade power you can generate, loads of really good trade goods to dev, loads of good land to dev, just a beauty all around. You nick trade from half the planet, you can nick trade from Europe, you can nick trade from um, America, you can even go into the Cape and the Ivory Coast and start nicking trade from Africa and Asia. Like, the English Channel is what the English Empire is built upon, and there we go. It's one of the empires, that's for sure. It's the definition of the S-tier. I mean, I think it would be an insult to your intelligence if I, go, if I start going into exact details of why exactly it's amazing. It's, it, just, it is, right? It is the definition of the S-tier. Soon to S you go, English Channel. No need to waste any more time on you. With that, then we move on to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a nice trade trade node because you can mine gold in it. Great. You nick from Katsina. It's a start node. You know, it's only nicking a lot of money from Katsina. If you really build up Katsina, you can get like five ducats out of it. Congratulations. You're getting more out of a single gold mine. And that's probably pre-dev clicks. Well, no, not pre-dev clicks. Okay, gold isn't that great relatively but my point is it's not that amazing the thing is with ethiopia is your trade goods there are quite nice see and you have a okayish amount of development certainly a good development by african standards the problem is your neighbors and your neighbors are alexandria and the gulf of Aden, and they're gonna suck you dry because jesus swept alive they are both gonna generate a lot more trade power than you ever will and you're inland so good luck defend yourself they're gonna shove a merchant there and you're screwed the Gulf of Aden specifically, because yeah, individually, the Gulf of Aden, before it unites, doesn't have a lot of um, trade power in it. But there's a whole bunch of random OPMs running out in Arabia, and especially the Gulf of Aden. So what they're going to do is all of them are going to be able to shove a merchant inside of you, and that's it, right? You're going to have five merchants all getting plus 50 base trade power from inland trade steering. GG. Um, you're not going to be able to retain a lot of trade power. And I think that's really what holds you back, is you have, you have the potential to be a decent workhorse trade you know, trade node, but you're just very much held back by just how easy it is to steal from you. So into high C tier you go, congratulations. I think probably this kind of position, it makes the most sense. That said, we move on to the reason I couldn't use the England thing for the English channel, because it was a bit too close and may have been confused, with Genoa. It's an end node. It's the second best thing after the English channel for steering half your entire planet into. It's amazing if you have a New World Empire because you can basically steer Sevilla into Genoa. It's amazing for a lot of the African trade as well. And you can nick a bunch of France stuff into it. It's great. You can nick from Alexandria as well. Alexandria is quite rich. It's, it's just a really strong trade node. And you start with a whole bunch of development in, in it. The thing is with Genoa is no one really starts in charge of Genoa in the same way that England has a dominant position over the English Channel. So you do have to conquer your way into Genoa. And because there's a lot of development there and you're in Italy the AE is going to be something that's going to be able to stop you a bit, depending on how good you are at the game and how good you're managing AE, so there's something to bear in mind. But once you have Genoa on lockdown, you're going to have, you pretty much have your license to print money. So enjoy that while you will. And I think it's going to be no spice to anyone why Genoa goes into S tier as well. 
Uh, you may have noticed there's a bit of a trend, though, even with that, of the starting nodes going into the D tiers and the end nodes going to the S tiers. And, well, it's a trade node tier list. What did you expect? Anyway, that said, we move on to Girin. Now, I'll be honest, Girin is an interesting one because uh, when I saw Girin, I uh, was... The... Well, when I was making my notes, um, the reason I remembered Girin existed was I was going to say that Siberia is not actually the worst starting node in the game and has some decent stuff going into it, then I realized that Siberia isn't actually a starting node because Girin exists. Um, so that just goes to show how much I remember Girin. The thing is with it is it's kind of the weak trade notes that the Horde start in is the best way of summarizing it at game start. It's not all of development, and the few development that is there get, kind of tends to get burnt early as the Hordes conquer each other and raise each other. So that makes it even worse. In California does go into it, Problem is, is that you're getting California, so it's not great. Congratulations, your um, Japanese colonial empire can steer a bit more trade into it. Unfortunately, Beijing is going to nick money from you, which is the least of your worries. Siberia, even though it's inland, is going to nick a decent chunk of trade power from you because you only have two centers of trade and an estuary. And Nippon is going to steal a lot from you because Nippon is going to be populated by a very high debt Korea on Japan, and they're going to be stealing trade from you. Before Japan unites, they're going to have a whole bunch of little OPMs running out with two merchants. They're going to shove one in Nippon and the other one in Girin. And when Japan unites, they're going to have a lot of development because they're going to be one united tag and they're going to shove a merchant in you and probably a small invasion army as well and make your trade centers. So it's a very awkward you know, trade node to be in. It's also just very poor. It's terrible to develop. It's just awful, to be honest. Basically, Girin is bad. That's the long short of it. And I feel like it's almost a nerf to some of the starting hordes they have to get out of Girin ASAP. So for me, it's certainly not as bad as some of the other trade nodes, but it's not exactly making its way into the C tier. Uh, I, I can't even put it above Brazil. I guess it's slightly better than Australia, but that's really not giving it much of a compliment. After Girin, we move on to the Great Lakes. Well, it's populated. Problem is, is that the trade goods around the Great Lakes aren't the best. They're okay. Compared to by other African standards, you don't have that much ivory around that area. And the development is not great, but it's not amazing. Fortunately, you're an inland starting node. So Zanzibar is going to nick a lot of stuff out of you. I'm sorry. And the Congo is also an inland node, but that doesn't stop it. That doesn't stop you being an inland node, so they're going to nick stuff out of you. The worst part about the Congo also being an inland node means that if someone like England comes along, they can shove a merchant in you inside the Great Lakes, they can shove a merchant inside the Congo, and boom, they're double, they're nicking out of both of you. Congratulations. There's really very little talk about the Great Lakes. Um, like, the area itself really isn't rich. And even if you do build it up, you don't make that much money from it. Take it from someone that got the uh, Tech 32 achievement from playing around the Great Lakes. I had to FK that one. It was not fun. Won't recommend. And the, I mean, I went with the Burundi flag for them. Um, they only have one cent to trade, by the way, in Buganda. Very hard to defend. But I went for the Burundi flag. I'm not sure why I did that. I think, well... It's an inside joke, but the problem is it's an inside joke for exactly me and two real-life friends, so congratulations. Um, Burundi. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with that. Anyway, the reason, I was going to, the reason I was kind of mentioning that is it's a very unremarkable trade node as well. You have, what, Lake Victoria inside of you? Well, I'm sorry, the game is set in 1444, not in 2044. Water isn't a trade good yet, so, you know, not really an issue around that. And it's just... Like, it's nice. It's a nice node to conquer and trade company, but you, you're not going to be having fun in that node. It's not as awful as some of the other Native American nodes, but that's not giving it much of a compliment. I'd probably prefer Girin over Burundi and the uh, Great Lakes trade node, but bottom of D tier, I'm afraid. That's all you're really getting. Anyway, that's about that. Let's now move swiftly on from uh, the Great Lakes into Gujarat. Already mentioned Gujarat a couple of times. The tags inside of Gujarat are be quite trade heavy, which is quite nice because they can steal from Lahore, they can steal from Dekan, they can steal from Coromandel, and they need to defend their trade because they can go to the Gulf of Aden, they can go to Hormuz, they can go to Zanzibar. They basically can steal money from trade nodes that can defend themselves, and they can get stolen from, from trade nodes that can steal very much from them. They are coastal, so they're at least they can defend themselves with trade power, and they have a decent chunk of, sort of centers of trade, I believe seven, as well as an estuary. So there's a decent amount of residual trade power for them. It's a very contested trade node. Gujarat, if you're ever fighting over trade without stabbing other people, it's probably going to be happening in Gujarat over India. Gujarat or Lahore. The thing is with Lahore is Lahore is a battle you're not going to win. It's an inland node. 
whoever's invading you with their merchants is going to win that battle. With Gujarat, it's a contested battle on the trade battlefield as well, so bear that in mind. Thing is though, Gulf of Aden can be quite rich, Zanzibar can be quite rich, Hormuz can be quite rich and very powerful. So be very careful. The nice thing is, if you are building around Gujarat, you're probably playing as one of the tags in Gujarat or playing as, well, Gujarat. And those tags tend to have a lot of trade buffs, so you have that kind of going for you. So it's 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 a contested battle, but you're equipped for that battle is the best way of putting it. Like, right, you're not just thrown into the, go fight the Ottomans, here's Tex 3 in a dream. Go fight the Ottomans, you have Tech 6 against Tech 5 on them, and you can take at least a couple loans in the process, right? You know, it's it's a battle that's winnable, I think is the best way of putting it, compared to the battle over something like uh, Lahore, which the invader is just going to win because of the in that straight series. So, because it's a contested trade node, and it's still an Indian trade node and quite good, I honestly think um, it's going to be better than the other inland ones, but I just... I think it squeezes into the bottom of A tier because you can kind of build your Indian trade empire around it as well. But it's not exactly... Um... Well, I think it definitely squeezes out the Dakan and other tags, but VJ and Korm and the other A tiers are definitely sitting very comfortably above it. You have to work for Gujarat to be an A tier trade trade. But the thing is, again, as I said before, you at least have the capabilities and the tools to do so if you're planning that area. Anyway, I think that makes. I hope that makes sense. We now move on to the Gulf of Aden, another uh, trade node named after a tag. This one's good. This is one of the trade nodes that can steal from Coromandel. This is a trade node that can steal from Gujarat, and you can steal from Ethiopia if you want to pick on a weaker target. You do, however, also need to defend yourself because you are going to Zanzibar, you're going to Hormuz, you are going to Alexandria. It's a very similar story to Gujarat. You have Coffee Arabica, so you're making a decent chunk of money that way. And you have a whole bunch of trade centers. So again, it's a relatively rich area in terms of your trade. You are, however, still poorer than Gujarat. Gujarat is, of course, still got that a little bunch of that Indian wealth going for you. So you are basically just a weaker Gujarat. I think it's the best way of summarizing it. You have a lower dev to work with, but at least your enemies that you're killing early game are also weaker. And the potential is still very much there with the Gulf of Aden, especially because the potential involves Gujarat. So I think for that reason, you're going to beat here as well. It's uh, a decent beat here. And in the Gulf, but not too high up above there. With that, though, we move on to everyone's favourite, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Now, I've used a Canadian flag for that one. Apparently, that's the old Canadian flag before they changed it. And let me tell you right now, thank God they did, because um, honestly, this flag isn't awful. I've seen much worse flags, but the new one is a lot better. So good job on Canada. You, you improved on your flag quite a bit. The Gulf of St. Lawrence is good because it can go, it can nick stuff from the Chesapeake Bay. Right? And Chesapeake Bay can, drink, can nick from the Caribbean. The thing is with the Gulf of St. Rollins is it's in a weird situation where if you're building your trade empire around it, you're basically planning an entire New World campaign and you're probably better off just using it as a pseudo endo generator for the Chesapeake Bay. If, however, you are playing a, some kind of Canada campaign, you're going to struggle because that means you're probably not going into America because that's contested or there's another USA-like player if you're both playing colonies. And it's going to be worse than that. And you're not going to be able to even use Ohio in that case. You're going to be able to get money from Hudson Bay. And Hudson Bay really sucks. You also do go to border in the North Sea. You kind of have some insulation that you don't go to the English Channel directly. And that can be nice. That extra step from the North Sea and Bordeaux can somewhat protect you at least. But it's not great anyway. It's a weird one. And the thing is when it comes to centers of trade. It's very hard to build up a defensive trade power for you. You're very much carried by the fact that you can, you're can. you basically in addition to the Chesapeake Bay for like a USA player. But that's kind of what's holding you to almost relevancy. And I think that's kind of what's really keeping you out of D tier. Um, but you're not a great one by any stretch of the imagination there. I mean, you're a solid C tier because of um, your potential to work with a USA, you know, um, the entire New World United kind of build. But that's really what's carrying you, as I said before. Right, with that said, we move on to the Ivory Coast. Now, the Ivory Coast is basically the African version of Bengal. A lot of stuff comes into it, a lot of stuff comes out of it. Brazil comes into it, Cape of Good Cop goes into it, Congo goes into it, which is your easy pickings, you know, your inland node that you can nick out of. Timbuktu goes into it, again, your easy pickings that you can nick out of. Thing is, it's not very colonized at the start, so it's more of a, unless you're playing Benin, which is the, uh, the flag I went with today, which is a cool flag. So it's tend to be a bit of a weird one. If you are playing inside the Timbuktu area, you tend to expand into the Ivory Coast and use that for your trade power. But then you're kind of also fighting Europeans for it, either inside the Ivory Coast itself or upstream from the Ivory Coast. So it's a bit of a weird one in that regard. 
but yeah, very workhorse, very decent trade goods, very decent development to be honest as well. Just basically the Bengal of Africa is the best way of summarizing it. And I, the flag is here. Shh, shh. That's weird. The orders, um, the orders messed up. I import it into here using alphabetical order, but sometimes it just doesn't listen. I go through it before the video starts and try and sort it out in alphabetical order, but clearly I missed that one. My apologies. Anyway, back to uh, back to the Benin Ivory Coast um, trade node. I think there's not much more to say there. You have a decent amount of trade centers of traders are for contesting it. Yeah, it's it's a workhorse trade trade good. It's certainly no Bengal, but it's. It's a good one for that. And if you are conquering into it, it's kind of the intermediary step if you want to get into the Cape money, if you're doing something like an England or France run. Controlling the, the Ivory Coast is a good way of controlling a decent chunk of Africa is the best way of putting it. So I think for that, we have another entry into our B tier. Um, not as good as the... Uh, probably around here, to be honest, if we have to pick a position. Right, with that said, we move on to... Katsina. What is happening with the order today? Because that's one of those... Oh lord, give me a second. Ah, I love important things that don't work well. Anyway. Because I believe the one after this is Kazan, so... Yeah, this is... Oof. All the way over here. Well, the honest answer is basically that. So, Khan and Bornu is what I used to represent Katsina. Not too much good in that node, unfortunately. The problem with Katsina as a trade node, again, is the starting node, and you have Ethiopia, Timbuktu, and Tunis to make out of you. The good news out for you as Katsina is Ethiopia, Timbuktu, and Tunis are quite weak nodes to nick things from you. So congratulations. Um, it's poor people stealing from poor people is the best way to summarize it. They're not going to have too much trade power as well. Tunis basically just gets bullied by the people upstream from it. So it's not going to have that much generation on it, but still be careful. They can, you know, they can still nick from you, and you're an inland node, so you're quite susceptible to that. Timbuktu tends to be quite weak as well because it's quite disunited. Um, it tends to be not getting too united unless it's united by a European, in which case good luck. Or it's united by a player, in which case you, they're just going to be stronger than you. I did go with Canon Bornu for them because, um, well, I had quite a fun um, CK3 campaign as Canon Bornu to do Murder of All Africa. And I think their flag is cool. But really no real reason to go for that one for Cancida. With that said, as far as trade nodes go, it's a, it's a starting node. And there's not a lot of promises for it. So even though some of your trade goods are good, you're really struggling with just how weak much your promises are. Honestly though, at least the trade nodes are okay and you can at least build yourself to something reasonable. But top of D tier is the best you're getting. I'm sorry. That's all I can give you. And with that said, we move on to Kazan. That's a, that's a fun one. Alright, because I know uh, Kiev is coming next. Kazan is kind of the, the trade node that Russia and a lot of the Russia-based Novgorod trade empires tend to use to stuck things into Novgorod. Kazan gets money from Siberia. Siberia is an inland one. The thing is, Siberia is a great one to suck money out of. It's very big and it's got like not awful trade goods with furs. Like furs is just a very workhorse trade good. It's not amazing, but it's decent. So you're going to make a decent chunk of money from Siberia. You're going to make a decent chunk of money from Astrakhan especially if you build up Astrakhan to make from Persia. And Novgorod is, well, a very strong trade node, but it's not... It's usually a trade node you control if you go into Kazan. Because normally if you're playing Kazan, you tend to be playing either a Horde or you tend to be playing Russia. So as a Horde, you're probably killing Russia again, so they're going to have control of Novgorod. Or if you're playing in a Kazan area, you're playing as Russia, so you tend to be conquering it. So it's kind of mitigated almost. You only have two centers of trade, so I'm going to be generating a lot of trade power from it itself. It's on a big node. But it's a great build your empire up node, and it's a great node to steer things into. It's a it's a weak workhorse, the best way of putting it to it, and it's I think it puts up a very solid C tier performance. But that's about all it's getting. With that, though, we move on to Kiev. Huh. it's an inland node. It's an inland node inside of Europe. That's a recipe for disaster, to be honest. Um, it's an inland node a bit uh, a bit closer to Kazan as well. The thing is with Kiev is Kazan is a bit too far away for your tags like. Your Germans to worry about. The problem is though, the Germans are going to be sucking money out of, well, not Krakow. And if they already have a merchant sucking money out of Krakow and they gain an extra one, guess where that merchant's going? Into Kiev, sucking out of you. It's a pain to build up. 
It's a great one to have if you're playing as either Poland or if you're playing as um, Russia to go into Kiev because you can nick that trade power for yourself into either Krakow or Novgorod. So that's got at least that going for it. But you only have three centers of trade, so you have to very much rely on upstream for it. And you can nick from Crimea, so that kind of helps if you're trying to nick from Crimea. And, you know, a lot of people are trying to nick from that. But Crimea is a contested trade node to nick from as well. So it's a bit of a weird one. Decent potential. The thing is that at least Kiev makes up for it is you have a lot of step promises, which are at least reasonable to develop. You also have a lot of uh, farmlands and, you know, and um, grasslands to build up as well. And your trade goods are... They're not great for actual value. You have a lot of grain, but you have a lot of grain. So if you're trying to get all manpower and all the stuff like that, it's pretty good in that regard. So I think Kiev really gets knocked up a peg for that reason, um, simply because it's relative potential, but it's not earning anything above the CTL, let's be honest. Um, I'd honestly probably put it below Canada, but hey, at least above the uh, Bastard Trade Node. With that, though, we do move on to the Congo. Christ, these, this order really got messed up, didn't it? Um, the Congo is an interesting one, that's for sure. Christ, you would have got messed up. The Congo really is an interesting one, that's for sure. Um, the Congo tag itself, I think, overinflates how good the trade node is, because Congo has all of these stuff coming for it, especially after the Origins update. But you can only nick out of the Great Lakes, and you go to Ivory Coast and Zambezi. Zambezi is not going to steal a lot of money from you. Problem is, Forever is in the um, Zambia trade node. Is going to shove a merchant into Zambezi and then by extension into you. You're going to have a lot of your money nicked. And there's not that much you're going to be able to nick out of the Great Lakes. You only have four centers of trade and you're inland. You're just a prime target to exploit, I'm afraid, in the Congo. So even though you have some, some okay-ish development, well, to be honest, some decent development and some decent trade goods, it's just way too easy to nick money out of you. So as objectively, as far as, as trade goods go, yeah, I mean, again... Probably nearer Ethiopia as far as trade good tier, uh, trade node tiers go, but you're really going to struggle for that. Now, to be clear, Congo can mitigate some of these issues, but it mitigates those issues by expanding really quickly and conquering the nose this nicks out of. So, yeah, that's more of a, a testament to how good the Congo is as a tag compared to how good their nick trade node is. Well, that said, though, we now move on to Krakow. That's your Poland trade node. It's a good trade node. It has a lot of decent development. It's got great potential to dev. It's got good trade goods. Everyone in the on the planet is going to nick out of you. The problem is, is that you're right next to Germany. You go to the Baltic, you go to Saxony, you go to Vienna. Those trade nodes are flush with random German OPMs that have merchants running around that are doing absolutely nothing and have nothing better to do than just shove merchants out of you and make all of your money. Even if you conquer the entire Krakow trade node, you, at the very early game, when there's a whole bunch of German OPMs running around, you're going to be lucky if you have like 40% of it. Because... It's so easy to steal from you. You have five trade centers of trade for defending yourself, so building yourself up can be kind of an option. But the honest best option as Poland is just to invade Germany. You kill two birds with one stone, you don't have to worry about Germany uniting and posing a threat to you, and the German land's quite good, and you get better trade because no one's taking it from you. But as far as Poland goes itself and the Krakow node goes itself, it's a good node as long as you can hold on to your trade. So for me, because it's so hard to well actually hold on to the wealth that you're generating. It's, it's another C tier entrance for me, but it's a pretty decent one of that, probably above Kazan. It's it's a very similar situation to the uh, Champagne trade node. It's a great one on its own, probably actually prefer up Champagne, to be honest. It's a great trade node on its own, but it's just so hard to hold on to it. Right, that's um, that's Krakow done. We now move on to Lahore. Uh, I had Afghanistan for this one. Um, because it's a bit of a, it's almost like a Mughal dream. Lahore is kind of where the Mughals established their wealth sucking into Persia. And it's very much an intermediary step, right? kind of like a, a mini Persia used to extract value out of India. But the problem is, is that if you're building around Lahore itself, you're not going to be able to defend it. You're not going to be able to have, you're not going to be able to stop Persia sucking money out of you. But you can also steal a lot of money. So you're in a similar situation to a couple of other tags where you can steal a lot of money, but a lot of money is getting stolen from you as well. It's it's not a great situation to be in, and unfortunately that's the kind of good summary of, well, a, a relatively weaker trade node. The thing is, is if there is going to be a slacker for the Indian trade goods, it's going to be Lahore, simply because a bunch of your land is actually kind of in the mountains outside of India. It's very much in the Kashmir area, which has decent trade goods, but you're, on the side of the, uh, you're inside the glacial mountain, so good luck diving that to any reasonable amount without spending the equivalent of an entire Avatech on one tax dev click, right? So, 
it's a it's a probably the the weakest engine trade node by far but it's still an engine trade node and it has still has decent potential the problem is it's very much an intermediary step you use whether it's persia to nick from or as india you conquer into the horse you can kind of at least retain some of your indian wealth that fact that it is useful to conquer and useful to expand into i think knocks it up to b tier but i can't knock it anywhere above the bottom of b tier for me anyway that's that that's for um that's the, the whore let's now move on to lahasa that's a fun one that's your tibet area good little tibet flag look at it go it's looking nice and happy it's terrible <laughs> this uh, there's not too much to say there Way too easy to steal from you. You have loads of trade monsters around you that's going to basically use you as an easy target for lunch money. And good luck doing anything inside of you. Even your trade goods aren't great. And again, you have the same problem as Lahore, only your entire trade node is an Arctic Mountain. So good luck. It's. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, probably worse than Jansar. I'd even probably prefer playing in Burundi than playing in a Lahore. But there we go. With that, we move on to Lima. Lima is an interesting one. Also, where the hell did the Lima... Um... Where the hell did my Lima flag go? That's the Peru one, I believe? Huh. One second. Am I being very stupid? What did I use for the Lima flag? You can tell they're very good representations. By the fact that I'm myself thinking like, oh, what did I use for the Lima flag? Oh, of course, Cusco. I'm being very stupid. I was like, ah, oh, I could do Peru, but Peru is a weird colonial nation. I'm not sure if it even exists. Let's just go Cusco because most people are playing the Inca. And now I forget inside the tier list. Oops. Well, there we go. Anyway, uh, getting back to the actual uh, tier list itself. Now that we're talking about Cusco, it's bad, right? It's, it's, you're going to make your money from gold, you're not going to make your money from trade. You you get it from Cueva, but Cueva sucks. You go to Panama, but half the planet goes to Panama, because Panama then goes to the Caribbean, so nice, people could steal money, whatever little money you have. The Panama um, Caribbean can make from you. And whatever little pennies you are making, the Polynesian Triangle and um, that kind of Japan-ish levels of builds can also make from you. Congratulations. Your trade goods are either gold, so they're nice for building non-trade related income, or they're not gold, in which case they're kind of meh, to be honest. So it is, it's just bad. <laughs> so I'm sorry, that's the best way of summarizing. It's just bad. Into detail you go. And now we move on to Lubeck. Lubeck's a fun one. Lubeck would be amazing if it wasn't for one thing, the English Channel. Lubeck generates a huge amount of trade power, it's a lot of really good trade centers in it. It's uh, it's not inland compared to the rest of the things that it is making from, because it's making from Saxony, it's making from Rhineland, and the Baltic and North Sea do not have the trade power to compete with it, so you can uh, import a huge amount of money into it. It generates a huge amount of money on its own as well. Unfortunately, you are going to be in a constant state of fighting off the English from the English Channel, because it's way too easy as England to shove 100 light ships into the Lubeck node and pull like 50 duckers from you, right? So... You're going to be in a constant competition with Lubeck. If it wasn't for the English and for the propensity for the whatever takes over the English channel to shove loads of light ships in you and make your life a pain, Lubeck would be S tier. But simply because of the existence of the English channel, Lubeck is going to high A tier for me. Um, probably put knock it above the Caribbean, uh, probably above Bengal, but it's uh, it, it, it's no it's no S tier as well. Let, let's be clear about that. With that though, we move on to Malacca. That's a fun one. Christ, these three really jumped the gun, didn't they? Anyway. Malacca's a fun one. Um, it's, it has a similar issue to Bengal. Ironically enough, it also goes to Bengal in Cape of Good Hope, in that a lot of really powerful trade nodes nick from it, but Malacca on its own is rich. It has really good trade goods, has a lot of development going for it. It also nicks from Malacca's, which are incredibly wealthy. It nicks from Hanzao, which is incredibly wealthy. It nicks from Siam, which is all developing incredibly wealthy. And guess what else it nicks from? Canton. Right, so you yourself are an excellent trade node. You have set, you have seven centers of trade to defend yourself in. You have four really powerful trade nodes going into you, but you have to be careful because Bengal and Cape of Good Hope, whoever owns those, can shop and make your life a pain, right? And if you are playing as Malacca, expanding into Bengal is kind of a pain. It's not a very natural expansion to do, and even though it's something you want to do, 
it's a bit more natural to go into things like Siam first and into Burma even before you even get to Bengal. So it's not that easy to address the whole Bengal situation. And the Cape of Good Hope by far is the least natural place you can expand into. Because Malacca to Cape of Good Hope, you have to literally discover those provinces upstream from you to then recolonize or fight a colonizer for them. So good luck with that. It's a very similar situation to Lubeck, where if Malacca was an endnote, it would probably be an SD. It was simply how amazing it is. But it's the issue with Malacca is all the other people being able to name from it. So congratulations, into A tier you go, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, more specifically in A tier, I guess... I w I'd probably prefer Bengal to it, but not by much. And I think that's probably the fair ranking to give. With that said, we move on to Mexico. Mexico is a fun one. Um, it has a lot of sunny development. And it has a lot of gold inside of it. But even the promises that aren't gold in it tend to be pretty decent. You know, you have some chocolate and stuff like that inside of there. Some pretty decent trade goods all around. And there are, like, you do nick trade from California and Rio Grande, so you're not making that much, like, from nicking it. The thing is, the people that are nicking trade from you are very preventable, right? Caribbean is probably the hardest one to address, but Panama, you can just expand into Panama yourself and kind of prevent that being an issue. And Polynesian Triangle, good luck anyone building a trade empire around the Polynesian Triangle, right? I'm just going to discredit them right away. It's incredibly difficult. It's just genuinely easy to just build 100 light ships and call it a day, you know, protect and trade against you. Caribbean is going to be a problem. And that's where my recommendation to expand once you've consolidated Mexico, either as a colonial nation Mexico or as a Aztecs to go into next or secure the Caribbean, because that's going to be the main thing of nicking your trade power. But even though you have four centers of trade, you're not an inland node and you can gradually protect yourself because it's quite hard to nick from you specifically. Because once you've consolidated Caribbean, What's going to happen is people are going to try and steal money from the Caribbean, so you're going to be able to enjoy your wealth in Mexico in relative peace for the most part. So that's a pretty good one to know. For that reason, and I think the just decent amount of gold concentration inside of it, I think it knocks itself up to C tier, but it's going to struggle being that high up. I think this is probably a decent place before it. With that said, though, we now move on to the Mississippi River. <sighs> it's not, a, uh, not an amazing uh, trade node by far. Um, there's really not many countries in the Mississippi that could have used the flag for, but thankfully there is one country that is incredibly relevant, that is of course the Caddo, so they get to represent the Mississippi today. They should really represent the entire world, but that's a separate debate. Unfortunately, they're representing a terrible, <laughs> terrible trade note. It suffers from all the previously uh, aforementioned, you know, problems with the, um, with the trade notes. The Mississippi as well, I mean, it does nick from the California and Rio Grande. Um... Which is nice. Um, it's the same situation as Mexico. But you're also again going to Caribbean and Ohio. So you're just basically a week in Mexico without the gold and a lot less development and a lot less, um, a lot less trade power. And I feel like that's what Mexico had going for it. And you don't have that going for you. So into D tier you go. Uh, knock you up above Australia. Uh, but probably above Tibet as well. But you're not beating out Burundi, I'm afraid. Great Lakes are at least not a colonial nation. With that though, we move on to the Moluccas. That's a uh, that's a fun one. That's one of the things that makes the um, that makes Majapahit rich is the Moluccas. Majapahit gets a decent chunk of its trade um, from the Moluccas. The thing is with the Moluccas is it's relatively straightforward with your goal with how to prevent people making your trade. Go into Majapahit, right? Uh, sorry, not going to Majapahit. Um, go upstream. Uh, into Malacca. You do that, you're good. You've basically got a pseudo end node. You're not nicking a lot of money. You're getting money from Australia, which is terrible. You're getting something from the Philippines, which is decent. But you don't need to, because you're on the Spice Islands. You're going to be making bank just by retaining your trade. Your big goal with Malacca's is basically not get anyone to trade it away from you. And your big goal for Malacca's is to steal money from other people. You have five centers of trade, but you have a decent chunk of development to defend yourself as, defend yourself as well. And you're not inland, so people you can actually build light ships to defend yourself in that way as well. You also tend to be, if you're playing around the markets, tend to be doing a lot more naval builds. Because you have a lot of development on islands, you can afford to sacrifice uh, you know, army quality in an MP scenario and actually start doing things like picking up naval ideas. So there's plays around doing that as well, which I think is quite good. So for me, especially high potential and how relatively straightforward, if not tr if not easy, but at least straightforward, your goal is for make yourself an end node. I think you're definitely earning your place up in B tier. The issue is, again, it's 
any kind of late game betterment involves going to Magic Bar Heat and st uh, going in, uh, going upstream, not into Magic Bar Heat, my apologies, going into Malacca and stealing their trade value and basically building out, well, them. So it's it's hard to justify anything but a B tier. And in terms of the placement, um, probably above Benin, but not above Edgejan. Mm. No, I'll, I'll knock them above there. I think that's fair. With that said, and boy, this is turning into a long one, we now move on to Nippon. Ah, uh, Korea and Japan. What a combination. There's a lot of development, there's a lot of good trade goods. And it's relatively reasonable to make yourself an end node. Um, you do go to Hanzhou, so basically you want to invade China. And you do nick from the Polynesian Triangle. So you're basically not nicking that much trade power. Um, just make sure people aren't nicking trade power from you. You have a decent amount of centers of trade, six in total, but it doesn't involve as Korea either invading Japan or as Japan invading Korea. But you end up doing that anyway. It's a very nice, like, solo trade node build. You can definitely build a decent, like, economy and country around just staying in upon yourself and playing very tall around that. Basically, every single Korea tour playthrough on the internet you can find kind of does some version of that. So, I mean, simply because of that, I think it definitely makes its way into the B tier because it can allow for that kind of gameplay. But it's not that amazing overall it's a decent thing to conquer into and especially if you have china on lockdown it's a nice thing to add to your chinese wealth but the problem with that trade node as well is that they tend to fight back quite a lot and you're going to need a navy so you know that that has its drawbacks anyway with that said we finally move on to um well actually the north sea i was going to say uh hands out but no hands out is what you flow into um so with the North Sea, now I went with Norway for this one. You go into the English Channel, you go into Lubeck. You exist to feed those two trade nodes. And you're nicking from the Gulf of St. Lawrence and White Sea. You're not going to be nicking from much. You suffer also quite poor. You're not as awful as some of the other trade nodes. Let's be absolutely clear here. There are absolutely worse trade nodes, like the U-World ones. But you're not good as well. So pretty much a bottom of C tier or near the bottom. Um... Yeah, simply because it's so easy to nick out of you from a lot of these major trade empire builds. That's going to be your placement. With that though, we move on to the Novgorod trade node. That's a fun one. Novgorod trade node is how you kind of build around your trade as Russia, right? This is, this is what makes your trade tick as a Russia build. And because of this potential, because of the wealth of Russia and Siberia and all of the other good things you can stir into it, it's quite decent. The other thing that's important to realize with Novgorod is yes, eventually Novgorod does go into the Baltic and it does go into the White Sea. But it's relatively easy to grab control of the White Sea because there's not much going in there to at least pseudo and no Novgorod. And the Baltic Sea is at least contestable as Novgorod, namely that they don't generate that much trade power. So your six centers of trade and an estuary are pretty good to build up to at least defend yourself. Your land is quite devable. It doesn't start too dev, but neither does the Baltic. The Baltic. So you can kind of defend yourself there as well. It's a very workhorse um, trade node and has excellent potential, but it's not as immediately amazing as all of the other ones. So a high B tier as well, and definitely it, um, edges out the uh, a bunch of the other ones. But I think I I pretty comparable to the Ivory Coast for me as far as power levels go, to be honest. But it's going to struggle going above that. Anyway, that's um, Novgorod. We now talk about Ohio. Woo! That's this flag. Because um, I looked at the Native Americans in Ohio. There's a bunch of them. I recognized exactly none of them. And these guys have the coolest flag. The trade node sucks. I mean, it's it's a starting node. It exists to get stuff stuck out of it. It's not taking a starting node because it can nick out of Mississippi, but that's not much of a compliment to it. Um, it's an inland one, so it's also very easy for any Gulf of St. Lawrence people and just big Bay people nick out of. It also means that if England has colonized those areas and you're trying to play around a high onion you're trying to counter england they're going to just show a merchant in you and you're screwed right you have two centers of trade which is at least a little better a little bit better than the chesapeake bay but yeah not, not going to be anywhere near enough so good luck with that one uh into detail you go without much surprise anyway that's ohio we now move on to panama similar issue nathan what native american tribe do we do we do i even use for uh, panama um does it really matter? Not really. I 
Which one did I actually end up using? Because I'm not sure now. God, this thing's got messed up. I think they recovered themselves in a bit, because I do remember going through these, making sure they at least are in somewhat order. But, um... Let me just check my notes again, because Jesus Christ. I swear, I just went through these as well. So, after... Yep, after that was, um... Mm -hmm. Okay, ah! There we go. Patagonia. Uh, no, my apologies, sorry. Panama. Christ. Myself confused there. That's one of the Native American flags. I don't know them, right? So it's like, I need to find a flag that represents... Ohio, and I'm like, what, what's going on in Ohio? What, 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 what is Ohio? What is an Ohio, for lack of a better word? And this is where the, all this confusion brings. Um, I'm going to double check again now to make sure I haven't messed this stuff up and end up with a spare flag. I did use the deer for Ohio. I'm an idiot. My apologies. That was almost close. This is Ohio. And it's certainly not making itself into C tier from that. Oof, sorry about that. Ah. Uh, just goes to show these long tier lists are definitely taking a drain. I'm not doing the promised tier lists. Definitely not after this one. Anyway, with that said, we move on to the Panama. Goes to the Caribbean, but at least you can make from other places. It's kind of an extension of the Caribbean to me as a trade node in terms of sucking wealth out of the new world. On its own, though, it's a bit of a weirder one because you very rarely build around Panama yourself as a trade empire. You kind of tend to expand into it to build up your other things as well. So it's a very weird one to judge. Four centers of trade are pretty good, actually, by New World standards. And the dev there isn't awful. But you can nick out of Lima, you can nick out of Mexico. If you really do build it up, I think it becomes decent. The problem is, is that you have to really work for it to become tolerable. And really working for something to become tolerable, when you can just not work for something and have it, well, objectively better, I think, is the issue. So, for that reason, it's uh, it's another D tier entry. But it's a pretty decent D tier. Um, probably I'll knock that, above, uh, knock that above Brazil for sure. Anyway, that's um, that's Panama. Not too much to say there. Again, Native American flags and Native American flags. Christ, these guys really jumped the gun, didn't they? They've been I've been sending them to the back for a while now. I wonder how they slipped through my uh, through my things. I went over this whole like list twice to make sure it was in order, and it wasn't. Good to know. Anyway, uh, enough uh, little mini side chatter. Uh, we now move on from Patagonia to Persia. Persia. Persia's amazing. I think is the best way of putting that node. On its own, it makes absolute bank. Aleppo and Astrakhan tend to be... Aleppo tends to be quite contested between Mamluks and Ottomans, and by the time that Aleppo gets consolidated by the Ottomans or the Mamluks, you have the time to consolidate Persia and start fighting whoever wins that kind of 1v1. Full control of Aleppo, or at least to make them not steer out of you. Astrakhan has a similar situation, but Astrakhan takes even longer. Either a native, either a, um, a horde takes over Russia and makes those like an Astrakhan area. Or Russia takes it over. By the time they do that, and by the time their situation to start threatening you in Persia, you probably build Persia up to enough to push up to them. So while you do have to work for it, with Persia, you can kind of pseudo end node it by going into Aleppo and Astrakhan. It is an inland node, so you do have to work for it. The thing is, you suck in from Bastro, you suck in from Lahore, you suck in from Samarkand. You're going to make absolute bank right off the bat, because Persia is really strong. You're going to make absolute bank when you can start sucking in from Samarkand and Lahore, because those two trade nodes are not going to be able to defend against you. You can even expand it to Basra if you just have nothing better to do, and it's going to be a couple extra pennies to throw on the pile as well. And past that, your path is incredibly simple. You go into India and you make absolute bank from that, right? You're going to have so much trade power being generated in Persia upstream that you're going to be passing down into Lahore, and that is such an excellent center that I think Persia is probably the best trade node to play in around if you're not doing a global empire such as the UK. Persia for me is very much a perfect example of an S tier trade node that does not is not an end node. So into S tier you go. Congratulations on your placement. Good job. Not too much else to say there about Persia. I mean it's just amazing. Unfortunately, as I've now realized though, with Persia we did miss Patagonia. Um that's technically below Persia in the in the alphabet. My bad. It's all for Sri de la Plata. Not much else to say there. Sorry Patagonia. Um I, I looked at your game start. You make 0 0.03 ducats. Do I need to say more? 
Yes, you can be built up and debbed, but Jesus Christ, do you suck. There's not much else to say there. Sorry, Patagonia. Sorry I missed you, but it just goes to show how relevant you are. Into the detail you go. Is that even Patagonia? Christ. No, that's Rio de la Plata. I'm being very stupid. My apologies. Um, in terms of its actual deplacement, honestly, that I think that stands. <sighs> Next, however, on our list is, of course, going to be Pest for the Hungarians. That's a fun one. Pest is a fun one, is all I will say. Um, so, Hungary kind of has control over that node, for the most part, at the start. So I think the Hungarian flag makes the most sense. However, it very much suffers from the Polish problem, is that all the Germans in Vienna are going to be nicking it. However, unlike Krakow, you only have Vienna to worry about for your upstream monsters nicking money out of you. So that's quite nice. And you at least have um, Krak uh, you at least have Krabia and Ragusa to contend with you. Now, do be still careful. Um, you also do go to Krakow itself. So Poland might nick money out of you. And the Germans that have way too many merchants are going to be able to stick a merchant in Krakow and then a merchant in Pest and nick money from you as well. So it's a very hard note to take full control over. But it's a decent one. The land there is good to dev. No complaints there. It's a weird culture group in that if you're co if people are conquering into you, they're probably not going to bother accepting your entire culture group kind of thing. Because it's a bit all over the shop and it's not part of any other major empires. But... It does mean that if you're playing as Hungary and have that as your primary culture group, you are uh, fine in that regard to just dev push that land. And Hungary itself has a decent amount of potential. The land is decent, you even have a gold mine to go, which is quite rare in Europe. And yeah, a pretty decent trade node. You just, again, suffer from the same problem as Krakow, in that it's very easy to make money out of you. And technically Krakow is a bit easier to dev. It's similar to the Burgundy situation in that regard. I think you definitely ease out Kiev as a significantly better trade node. Probably Crimea as well, um, but honestly, I'd probably be rather be in Kazan than I'd be in uh, than being hungry. So there we go. With that, though, we move on to the Philippines. For the Philippines, I went with Sondo for the uh, nation flag. They are kind of one of the bigger people there, and Sondo is the start you need if you want to stack morale to the highest possible number, or at least it was when I routed it. I'm sure it's probably changed now. There'll be new updates, so I may need to revisit those old videos again, but we'll see. With that said, though. <coughs> The Philippines are a weird one. You can kind of, like, if you really want to build around from it, because you do nick from the Malaccas and the Polynesian Triangle, you can build up a large trade empire, but there are better tags that do that job better around you, and you kind of end up just being conquered most of the time. You do flow into Canton, which means you can also pseudo endo yourself in the Philippines relatively easily by going to Canton yourself. So it's not that bad, and with six centers of trade and being coastal, you can at least protect your trade relatively reasonably. It's a very weird one in, in that sense, because it's also not bad in terms of the starting dev that you have access to. The main issue, however, for you is the fact that um, devving isn't that easy. And furthermore, well, even if you are devving all that time, it's just not great, right? It's um, like The land isn't perfect to dev, and the trade goes are decent, but not amazing. So for me, uh, I'll take a... I, I think it's a, it's a pretty decent C tier. Uh, is it even a C tier? Like, the potential there is there, but no. No, I I think I have to give... I'm giving a bit too much credit to the C tier. Uh, a bit too much credit to the potential there. It's it's definitely going to be edging out something like Kazan, to be honest. There's been a pretty decent trade note, but I'm not seeing it competing with things like Nippon as well, or even Ivory Coast into the B tiers. So that's my reason for the placement. With that, though, we move on to the Polynesian Triangle. It's pure potential, because there's nothing else going there. It's like two ducats worth of trade value, and you're not exactly devving the Polynesian Triangle anymore. I think such a pure potential build only makes it viable for a global trade empire when you conquer it, and even then, it's just a jumping spot for shoving trade around your empire. And there's better ways to send your the trade around your empire than through the Polynesian Triangle. So, at least for that potential, congrats going to D tier, but I'm not having you any higher than that. That's not much more to say there. With that, though, we move on to the Rhineland. That was a weird one. I did go with Westphalia for the uh, flag choice for the Rhineland. It's just so easy to steal money from you as the Rhineland. You go into Champagne and you go into Lübeck. With Champagne, there's probably going to be an England and Genoa shoving a merchant in there. So, they ever get a second spare merchant, you go into the Rhineland and you're getting even tougher time. You're inland in Europe. Yes, you have six centers to trade, but good luck holding on to them. 
you've just been held upon in the same way that Burgundy and Krakow is. You are the, the node that people steal money from. So, yeah. Very similar to the Hungary situation. I'm going to knock you up above Hungary. Probably honestly above Kazan as well, but... The fact that I'm comparing to the Philippines should tell you what you need to know. It's just way too easy to steal money out of you. Yes, you're very highly debt, but you're just too easy to steal from, I'm sorry. And you end up having your stuff stolen all the time. Well, that said, though, we do finally move on to the Rio de la Plata. I'm going to just repeat myself. Native, terrible. You get the point. 0 0.03 duck is a game start. Give or take. Next question. Not much to uh, not much to debate. To debate. Although, after Polynesia and going straight to Rhineland, I realised I also missed Ragusa. Ragusa is a weird one. I think it's a shame that I missed Ragusa. It's because we should really talk about that one. It's kind of a weird one. Now, it's a very good one to conquer if you're building a trade around Constantinople. And it's nice if you play in a Venice game to go into Ragusa yourself. Because you can, um, you know, because you can steer out of it. It's also a decent one to go into as Hungary or any kind of pest... Um, Playstar, because one of the few things that actually go into Pest as well, so, and you can steer Constantinople through Ragusa into it. So it's a very, it's a very Bengali workhorse uh, trade note. You also have a gold mine in there, and we did have some pretty decent trade goods. The land's okay in development, but it's the Balkans, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a weird one to invade as well, um, in that regard. But I think Ragusa is a pretty good workhorse one for me, and pretty much a solid definition of the B tier. Uh, not much more to ask there. I'll knock it up above the USA, but I don't think it's beaten out the Baltic for its high rankings. With that, though, we move on to Texas, or Rio Grande. Uh, it's terrible. <laughs> Literally a starting node. And the only good news that you have is that you go into Mexico and Mississippi River, so you're probably going to get nicked from. But same, much like Australia, is you, that's because you don't have much to nick from you. So enjoy. And by the time you do have things to nick from you, those are the areas that are developed as well. Go, go enjoy your Australia placement. Honestly, probably even lower than that. I mean... Like... You're better than California, for sure, but that's not really much of a competition, right? That's Saying you're better than California is really not saying much. I mean, would I rather... I think I'd rather be in Tibet, to be honest, because at least then I can expand in Tibet in the hoods. But in that case, really knock Cando down a peg as well. But there we go. Or the Mississippi. Sorry, Mississippi, you got caught in the crossfire there. With that said, who's next on our list? Uh, Safi or Morocco? Christ, these guys really teleported to the front, didn't they? Morocco's a fun one. Um, you mainly go to Sevilla. So if you are doing some kind of Andalusia game, or where you are building around that kind of trade, you can semi-pseudo-endo yourself by going to Sevilla and locking yourself off. The problem is, you're getting sweet nothing flowing into you. Because what, you get Safi, you can expand it to Timbuktu, and then from Timbuktu you can nick um, Katsina, that's it. Peak trade power going into Safi is three nodes. You're at least pseudo and notable, so you scrape your way into C tier, but I'm going to struggle putting you... Um, I'll knock you above Mexico, but the fact that Ruthenia has more potential than you, sorry, Kiev has more potential than you, is uh, an indication of, well, honesty and insult. With that though, we move on to Saxony. Um, we do move on to Saxony or Transoxiana. Saxony has the same exact problem as the Rhineland, and pretty much the exact same thing going for it as the Rhineland. Uh, too many very powerful people nicking money from it. Uh, in this case, Lübeck and Rhineland, but Lübeck is enough to nick out of. And again, if, if England now has a third spare merchant, goodbye to all your money, or they just shove it into you directly. In fact, they probably won't even need to, because there'll be a bunch of OPMs from Lübeck on their little trade companies, with their little trade posts all shoving merchants inside of you to nick money from you. Yeah, five centers of trade is nice, but not enough to defend yourself from the merchant spam. So congratulations, go join Westphalia within your rankings. I'm going to put you below Westphalia because you did go to Westphalia, but that's about it. Right, let's move safely on now to Sevilla. Sevilla is good. The thing is with Sevilla is that Sevilla used to, Valencia used to not exist as a node, so Sevilla used to go straight to Genoa, and that made it quite easy to nick from Sevilla. The existence of Valencia now, any kind of Spain play can just go into Valencia and basically pseudo end on yourself. And then with Sevilla, you have loads of trade power estuaries. You have nine centers of trade within Sevilla itself. You have three estuaries, so you're going to be generating a huge amount of trade power. You're good land to dev, so you're going to have a lot of development-based trade power. You're just going to be an absolute monster. You're going to nick a lot of trade power from really good places. Tunis is going to get bullied a lot by a lot of people upstream from you, including you, but you can easily bully them. Safi especially, 
Very easy for you to go into. Ivory Coast is one of your big money makers, as it's going to be the Caribbean. Also, played in Seville and naturally tends to lead towards colonial gameplay, so you're going to be actually exploiting a lot of more of those trade nodes even more. Sevilla is, again, an excellent example of just an incredible trade node, which just really good things going for you. And it's the reason that, as France, you have three options to go for your trade. Spain, England, or Italy. And that's because Sevilla is also going to be making its way into the S tier. I did pick, um, I did pick the Spain Spanish flag instead of the Aragon or the... Um, or the Castile or the Portugal flag for Sevilla. That's because the Spanish flag kind of includes all of their flags united at the same time. So, you know, everyone gets represented for the most part. So there we go. With that said, though, we do move on back to our in, uh, intended next one of, uh, well, weirdly enough, Siam. Because, um... Oh, did I miss the mark uh, Transox? No, I did not. They are a T. Huh. Oh, well. Anyway. Siam. It's a weird one. A next from Burma goes to Malacca Canton, but gets incredibly heavy by carried by one thing, and one thing only, it itself is quite rich. So it's a good one to nick from. But the thing is with Siam is it's coastal and it has a decent chunk of its own trade nodes. Well, four centers of trade. But an estuary, four centers of trade, and a decent chunk of development inside of you, and a very good chunk of development to be absolutely clear. I mean it's actually quite painful to nick out of Siam, even with something as powerful as Malacca's Canton. So you have a very similar situation to Gujarat. In the sense that, okay, maybe you don't have a lot of things good that are downstream from you, but the people from upstream from you are going to struggle to, to contest you for your trade because you have a lot of development and trade to fight back. So, for that reason and that reason alone, I think it just barely does um, squeeze into the Gujarat tiers of B as far as good nodes. It's certainly no, uh, no stout like Poland that just has to accept the trade and be nicked, but it's not, I would definitely put it below Lahore and, uh, and Japan. We have our new lowest B tier entry. Right, that's that. We now move on from them to uh, from Siam to Siberia. I personally have a soft spot for Siberia simply because of how much money you can make from them. And they are one of the weirder, weaker nodes. But if you ever are building around Siberia, you tend to be building around from sucking money out of it. And it's a good trade node to gap, get because there's a lot of provinces. And they're actually, I mean, they're expensive to dev, but they're not completely awful to dev. And they're quite nice to trade company and shove a goods produced building on them. Because your trade good for the most part is furs, and, that, and furs are a very workhorse trade good there, very middle of the pack decent. I think Siberia barely makes its way into C tier, probably edging out Norway, but not by much, so congratulations on that placement. But at least it's not in D tier, and that's honestly a pretty decent ask these days. I've put a lot, put some decent nodes into uh, to, uh, D tier. With that, sir, we move on to Timbuktu. It's awful, right? Um, it's actually not awful on its own in terms of the development there, it's okay. And you do have some gold going for you. But, dear lord alive, it's so easy to steal out of you. Because if any kind of Sevilla goes into um, the Safi node, they're going to shove a merchant in you because you're inland and suck out of you. Ivory Coast is going to suck out of you and you're going to have a bad time. And the only thing you can suck is Katsina. That's just not, not nice to do. Right? You can get, what, like three ducats out of it? Because Katsina itself is pretty contested. Because Tunis is probably going to shove a merchant there, and so is Ethiopia. So it's a very weak one in that regard. You have five centers of trade, but not going to do you much in an inland node. It's... I don't think it has the um, the raw power potential to make its way out of, um, well, C tier in any reasonable expense. I think it barely makes its way into C tier, to be honest. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very Norway-esque tier, uh, tier placement for it. But there we go. Anyway, not much more to say there. We now move on to Tunis. Amazing. Problem with Tunis, you get harassed by uh, Valencia, Genoa, and Sevilla, right? All three of those nodes generate a huge amount of trade power downstream towards you. They're going to lick a whole, nick a whole bunch of your money, and you're not exactly making a lot of money uh, sucking yourself from Africa. So you have this weird combination of just a weak trade node yourself because you don't have great trade goods. The development isn't great. A whole bunch of that land is desert. And what little money you do have is getting stolen. No wonder these guys became the Barbary Pirates. Because outside of piracy, you don't have a lot going for you. But in terms of trade node... Yeah. Um, D, D tier you go. I'll, uh, I'll hold you above something like Brazil. Because it's not that completely awful. But it's not exactly good either. Anyway, that's Tunis. Let's now move into Valencia. Valencia exists to make Sevilla amazing. Valencia's entire purpose is basically 
prevent Genoa upstreaming from uh, Sevilla. And to be honest, it does that job quite well. As a node itself, it can suck a decent things amount of in into it, to be fair. And I mean, Aragon certainly doesn't struggle it on the Valencia node on its own. It does, um, you know... It does go into Genoa, so that's uh, a thing to bear in mind. But if you do have a... The uh, thing is, with Valencia, with three centers to trade and the fact that Sevilla has so many more, you're not exactly going to steal much money from from them. And with Tunis, um, well, everyone else is stealing what little money they can from Tunis, so you're not exactly going to be making much money from that. Most of the time, you're just going to be trying to protect yourself from Genoa stealing money from you. You're okay in terms of your development, but you're a very small trade node as well. Honestly, you're very much getting carried by the fact of how amazing you make Sevilla later. But on its own comparison, you are very comparable to the uh, Morocco star trade nodes, I'm afraid. Anyway, that's that. We now move on to um, our next one, Venice. It's an end node, and basically it's the improved version of Constantinople, right? If, you're to, if you have Constantinople and you invaded R Ragusa to make it an end node, just finish the deal, go all the way into Venice, and you have your end node secured now. You have relatively easy access to um, Persia as well if you're going for a major trade empire. Venice itself has a decent chunk of development. It's, it's an end node as well, so you're not worried about... Once you have 100% of the Venice, you don't have to worry about anyone upstream coming along and ruining your day. It's just a good one to have. I think it's the weakest out of the end nodes. And to be honest, I think it's probably the bottom of Estia. Persia and Sevilla are pretty good. And in some cases, even better than them than Venice. But it's an end Estia nonetheless. I mean, being an end node kind of guarantees Estia by proposition. So there we go. With Venice, though, we move on to the White Sea. And for them, I decided to use the Sabmi because there's not too much going on. For the White Sea, Novgorod kind of owns that. But Novgorod's already been used to the Novgorod node, so... Sorry about that. Um, it, it exists to make Novgorod better. It's a very similar trade note to Valencia in the fact that it's kind of a buffer state between Novgorod and um, the English Channel. So the problem is that compared to Valencia, it's objectively a lot worse than that. It's, yeah, it, it's going to struggle to do much of anything. So near the bottom of C tier. Not quite as bad as, I mean, honestly, yeah, I'd probably rather have a small Chinese node than, no, than the White Sea as well. It's it's not exactly useless because, again, it's a buffer this, this in trade note, but it's not great. Anyway, with that though, we move on to Vienna. Vienna's a fun one. I think I've realized what's happened. In the list I'm going off, uh, these notes, Hormuz and so on, were skipped. Um, oops, let's, uh, let's, let's circle back to them in a bit. Let's go sort out Vienna and um, what we have left on that list. Because uh, I have four left on that list, which I think makes sense. Yep, so these were skipped earlier. We'll, we'll go through them one by one at that point. But Vienna, uh, I used the Austria flag for that. Inland node. No complaints there. Ah, uh, it's weird. Vienna's a weird one in the sense that you can build a decent trade empire around it, but it's not good. Uh, because you just kind of want to get into Venice down south, because it falls into Venice, and you just want to stop the Germans nicking from you. Normally, when you're playing around Vienna, you tend to be either doing a Saxony, uh, sorry, a Bavaria kind of place through where you end up conquering Austria, or you're playing in Austria, in which case you're probably worrying about other things that aren't trade at that point. So it's a very weird one. But on its own, yeah, it's a good trade node because of the trade goods and development, but it suffers very much from the Poland Burger, from the Poland Champagne kind of Krakow trade nodes. It's way too easy to nick out of it. I think, honestly, it's, uh, it's better than Saxony, but worse than West than than um, uh, Rhineland for its potential. So into C tier it goes. C tier is quite extensive now, because I guess, well, that's that's how I judge. But there we go. Next, though, we have Zion. Uh, Zian. There we go. It's not great. Xi'an is definitely one of the slacking endnotes. It does go to Beijing and Yumen, so it's at least collected, but... Uh, it's it's kind of an inland steering one, but it's also a decent one to nick out of, so I wouldn't recommend steering through that. There's only two centers of trade, so it's quite easy to nick from it as well with the merchant. And its development and relative mountainousness doesn't help, but there's a couple decent provinces in it as well. It's... It's in a weird situation, to be honest. Um... I don't think it gets anywhere near the B tiers, but it definitely, I think, burns a spot inside the C tier. Very comparable to, I think, Norway and the Timbuktu in terms of just being a, a, a weirder, smaller end trade node. You don't really build a, an empire around it, but it's not awful to have, unlike some of the other ones I mentioned before. Anyway, that's the end. Um, let's now talk about Yumen. I used Aura for that one. It's a very similar situation to Xi'an, but at least a bit better. It only goes to Samarkand, so Yumen. You can at least pseudo endnode, 
And you can build an empire around it with, from Beijing and Xi'an. It's just compared to a lot of the other tr uh, trade nodes, that's a royal pain to do. Uh, you're not going to be happy doing that. So there we go. It's it's a weird one in that extent, in that it's a lot of work to make it an end node. But if you do make it your end node by uh, going up into Samarkand, you can basically have China and a lot of the other like good land on lockdown. But if you're going into India, you're probably going to have to move further up into Persia and try and end node that instead. So it's not really a, a permanent solution to end node it. The fact that it can be made into an end node, though, does to me tell indicate it's a pretty decent tier, uh, like trade node. Unfortunately, it's relative weak start and start is really holding it back. So for me, that's a B tier end node and not much more beyond that. After that, though, we move on to Zambezi. Uh, I used Mutapa for this one uh, as this little flag. Mutapa is a weird one, um, and especially as a Zambezi trade node. It's inland and it does get nicked by Zanzibar. But if you're playing in that area, you're probably moving into Zanzibar. If you're not moving to Zanzibar because there's a player there or you can't, you're probably going to have your campaign game ended because that's, that land, Zanzibar is going to outscale you. So it's kind of a do or die. So I either assume your campaign ends, in which case you don't need a tier list, or you're conquered into that area. So I can assume you're, it's kind of one of your starting trade nodes. But if we have to look at the trade node itself, which we we're doing for this video, one thing stands out for it. It's good to just own that trade node and it's good for the gold. But it, you're not going to make a trade empire out of it, right? Let's let's be honest. Um, you're not going to exactly make bank by nicking money from the Congo, uh, unfortunately. At least, though, it only goes to Zanzibar. So if you do have Zanzibar on lockdown, you can pseudo end node it. Not that I choose much for you, but hey, it, it can be done. And if you are playing in the area... <clears throat> ah, sorry. If you are playing in the area, it's not the end of the world. Because you're still going to be making a bunch of money from Gob. So, yeah. For me, it's not a great trade note, but it's definitely no uh, detail. Um, in terms of placement within C tier, that's a bit of a weird one. I'll probably not put it as hard as Norway, but yeah, around here, I think nearer to the book two is probably quite fair. With that said, though, we move on to Zanzibar, the last of our uh, trade notes and the last absolute monster. <sighs> I've used Killer for this flag because Zanzibar, uh, Killer is actually tag Zanzibar. Zanzibar is amazing. It's really good for consolidating the money you nick out of uh, India as well, in the same way that Persia is. And all you have to do to make Kilwa, which can suck a lot of money out of a lot of good places, Great Lakes, Gujarat, Gulf of Aden, you know, Zambezi even, so that's the Congo. So basically half of Africa, and you get uh, most of India and anything downstream from that. You can lock that all down by just getting the Cape of Good Hope. Easier said than done, but you're in an excellent position to do that if you are around the Zanzibar area. You also have a whole bunch of coastal centers of trade for you, I believe, on my in my notes. Let me check. That is nine centers of trade, yep, and as an estuary that you have for Zanzibar. So congratulations. You know, it's you can definitely maintain a lot of control that and use it to project downstream. You project downstream very well. It's basically a coastal Persia, and for that reason, it's also our entry into S tier. I don't think it's as good as Sevilla, but it's. Uh, I'll probably have a, yeah, I, I think uh, it's very comparable to Venice, to be honest, but I think Venice just barely speaks out by the fact it's a guaranteed end node as well. But there we go. Right, to get back to the ones we skipped, my apologies to them. Transoxiana is an A tier one. I won't beat around to bush, uh, the bush too much. It has a similar thing going for, for Persia, just a bit harder to hold on to because Persia tends to have so much power. But Transoxiana is just an excellent node on its own with a lot of good trade goods and a lot of decent development. It's basically Persia with a lot less potential, but still a decent amount of money still that you can put into Transox. A very, very nice head who would trade good without question for sure. Now we move on to this one. Uh, this is the Native American, I believe, for Ohio. Um, this is a weird one to um, to rank in the sense that, well, when, when are you ever uh, when are you ever making a, a trade empire around Ohio? If you ever are, then congratulations. You've been a very unique campaign. Unfortunately, you're basically a glorified, um, you're a glorified, uh, well, Start node, so into detail you go. Uh, pretty close to California, honestly. Yeah, I think California is probably still at least better because you're at least larger, but yeah. Then we have Hormuz. Hormuz is a very nice workhorse um, trade node as well. It kind of does what Gujarat does to some extent, 
in the sense that, uh, sorry, not Gujarat, it, it nicks from Gujarat, but it kind of does what the Gulf of Aden does to that extent as well. It can nick from India, it can nick from Gujarat. Does it a bit worse than the Gulf of Aden, I believe, but it still does a decent job at it. And it's very much one of those build up a trade to contest India areas. Is the It's kind of like the Horn of Arabia where you can make a decent chunk of money, but you have to work for it. So for me, for that, and it's decent potential, and honestly not awful trade goods at the start, Although the developer's dev development is lacking. It's kind of hovering between C and B tier. I think uh, near the bottom of B tier is probably around fair. Um, yeah, I think I think Ragusa edges it out, but it's it's gonna be better than the US, I'll tell you that much for Bombers. That though we finally have our last um our last uh, one that we missed, and that I believe was was uh, the not um did I rank Shanzo? I think that's the, uh, yeah, that's Jan Zhao. That's the one I missed. Han Zhao, sorry. Uh, I can't believe I missed that one. It's very similar situation to Canton. It's definitely one of your workhorse, um, one of your workhorse, uh, basically, Chinese tax, right? It, it's going to get in there. It's going to get you the goods produced. Uh, it's going to generate you a lot of the trade of this is while you're invading China. Basically, if you want to get the actual TLDR there, hear what I did for you, repeat that. That's the deal with it. Anyway, that's... Um, all ready to say about that. Um, so with that said, where did I where did I end up putting um, them? Yeah, in B tier, that makes sense. It's slightly worse than Canton, but definitely better than some of the. Yeah, I very much agree with the statement placement over here with B. That's where it belongs. It's a, one of the better Chinese, basically one of the things that make China good. Anyway, that was quite a long one. Definitely the longest video I've made so far. Uh, had quite a few water breaks in there. Hope it didn't come off too badly on camera. Um, the importing files, I think I didn't mess it up. I think what happened is I skipped some of my list when I was reading them. To be fair, there were 80 trade notes. That was a big one. So there we go. I hope you enjoyed. So with that all said and done, thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Goodbye.